Thanks, Camille. So welcome, welcome to my, my flat, my new flat back from Switzerland, my London flat. Um, welcome to miserable London. We, we lost the football and it's, um, I don't care about football, but I mean, it, it's, it's, you see the faces in London, people are really sad. It's, it's, this is really kind of like quite a depressing thing. Anyway, so the UK is in quite a somber mood right now and because uh, of, of the football match. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm unaffected because I don't really follow the football. In fact, I, I made a point of actually not watching the game. And uh, my, my partner texted me saying England lost. I thought they'd won because I watched the first 10 minutes. Actually, at my ex-partner's place, I took my daughters back to Bishop Stortford. And I watched the first 10 minutes. I thought, yeah, they, look, as I drove back, it bucketed down rain. I thought, England, you can't lose. Look, you got, you, you won, you're one goal up. And it's pouring down a rain, which would disadvantage the Italians. There's no way you can lose. And what, what do you know? I, I'm, I'm, you know, they, they lost. Anyway, that's the way it is. That's the way it goes. So, so this is like uh, the, the, the part three of uh, this kind of three part series. Um, it's going to be about six hours total of public speaking. And it's a huge subject. How do you, how do, you do system change? And um, I realized I, I prepared about five hours material. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go for the main points uh, tonight and tie up the loose ends of the first two talks. Now to make this talk relatively standalone, we'll just quickly recap in a few minutes what the first two talks were about. Okay, the first talk really uh, pressed home the idea of the, uh, the critical importance of worldview or Weltanschauung, which is this idea of an organic unity of ideas, the idea that contains all the ideas. And that's absolutely essential if you want to change things politically. So absolutely, we, we spoke about that at length just to ram home the point. So it's not about an ideology or kind of like a manifesto or kind of like list of demands or even a kind of like, uh, you know, a whole political program. You need to change the entire worldview, including metaphysical and cosmological assumptions. We, we kind of really uh, made that point in the first talk. Now the, now the second talk um, really that was ambitious because it sought to resurrect for the 21st century the core metaphysical and cosmological assumptions that emerged during the Renaissance, which gave rise to all these revolutionary movements that would happen in Europe. And also the, these are the same set of metaphysical assumptions that really drove the revolutions in China and also in the, in the Muslim world. Okay, so that was something we did. And um, it's really to resurrect this kind of hidden religion that was really part of the, the key part of the Renaissance, this Prisca Theologia. And the key point of the second talk was basically something miraculous. No, no, well, no, I shouldn't say miraculous. Something amazing has happened in the world of science in the past, literally past five, 10 years, in that all the puzzle pieces of the scientific jigsaw puzzle have come together in such a way now that it completely, we can now uh, speak of this hidden esoteric religion, this perennial wisdom, this Prisca Theologia in completely scientific language. So the, 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 the scientific um, kind of uh, jigsaw puzzle comes together in such a way as to completely resurrect this, this core of all, all world religion. Okay, so that, that was quite a, quite a major thing we attempted in the second talk. So now we're gonna basically uh, just flesh it out and relate it to existing uh, revolutionary movements and social movements of the present day and, and how do these, these big picture concepts, you know, Weltanschauung, worldview, uh, grand sweeping views of history and metaphysics and cosmology, but how does it translate to nuts and bolts social movements and you know kind of what's happening in the world today and and uh, that, that's what we're going to fill in the details in, in this uh, last part of this three part series. <clears throat> okay, so um, the uh, we we got to basically explain. Okay, if worldview is so important. What exactly is that worldview that's going to change the world? Okay, well, what is it? Okay, so what it is, it, it's, um, it's a click on, click on my face. Can I get my face? Okay, so, so I can see. My... <clears throat> what it is, it's this. The, the, the worldview that's going to change the world is basically, it involves a reform of all knowledge. Okay, so how can we discuss a worldview in a few hours of public speaking because we, we the new worldview emerges from a process and this process involves the reform of all knowledge it doesn't mean we reform all you know every single factoid that exists you know one plus one is still equals two all mathematics science that doesn't change a new worldview comes along it's not like uh, you know everything changes every it, 
the fundamental things change. It's really a kind of resynthesis of existing ideas and the rearrange in a new way to form this new worldview. So we talked about a lot about Renaissance and resurrecting the Renaissance worldview. It doesn't mean we resurrect Plato, Aristotle, Roman archers, and that's going to change the world. What it means is basically um, this Prisca theologia, this kind of hidden esoteric religion, once it's resurrected for the 21st century, that is the stepping stone for basically reforming all knowledge. Now, to put things in a, in a historical context, <clears throat> this is really, really important for um, <clears throat> revolutionary movements. You give people a kind of sense of continuity. <clears throat> so this idea of a reform of all knowledge was actually part of the Renaissance. Okay, in, in, for instance, um, Giordano Bruno, who is the uh, kind of uh, this uh, proto-scientist, a huge figure of the Renaissance, Italian Renaissance, in his Italian writings, he writes about the reform of all knowledge. Okay, so that's the Italian Renaissance, the reform of all knowledge. And even the oration on, on the dignity of man, Pica, Pica della Mirandola, the manifesto of the Renaissance, it, it really is about a, a reform of all knowledge. And okay, the, the Rosicrucian Manifesto, the Three Point Manifesto, abolition of monarchy, the search for this panacea, cure for all. The third point was the reform of all knowledge, spiritual, scientific, political, all, all knowledge of Europe was going to be reformed by the Rosicrucians. And uh, okay, famously, Francis Bacon, uh, okay, the, the, the father of modern science, he talked about the great insaturation. Again, the same thing, all knowledge, spiritual, temporal, political, needs to be reformed. Okay, so so this, uh, just go back, to, okay, screen, I've forgotten how to use Zoom already. So if I screen share the first, uh, first screen, oh, what is it? Okay, screen one is this one. Okay, so I need a screen share. Okay, so in, in the, the, the second talk, basically what we resurrected was the, the key central beliefs of the esoteric religion that recur again and again in world religion, also this kind of Prisca theologia. And um, what, it, what it means basically is that we, okay, one, by resurrecting the Prisca theologia, the esoteric religion, the perennial wisdom, of course, I mean, we re revise our ideas of what is religion. It means that there is this hidden religion that was practiced by the Sufis, the kind of Gnostics and the kind of like esoteric sects of India, Taoists and stuff, which often gets suppressed. So that's a revision of the history of religion, okay? But for political purposes, what you really need to reform for political purposes, okay, science doesn't change, mathematics doesn't change, but for political purposes, what you need to reform is our idea of history, our ideas of the present world and our vision of what the future is. There's also something else that needs a complete reformation is basically there's a missing narrative that is that's really important for system change and for revolutionary movements and that needs to be resurrected. So th these four points is what is involved in this uh, kind of reform of all knowledge. Okay, so okay, um, once we have this kind of Prisca theologia resurrected, now we can go on to resurrect firstly this uh, this kind of idea of this missing narrative. So let's go to the next diagram. Let's move the thing over there. Okay, so um, so stories are really important. We've got this thing called worldview, metaphysics, and grand sweeping view of history and cosmology. But really, what people really respond to is, is stories. Okay, so stories are really important, narratives, because people's brains respond to stories. So for the purpose of revolution reform, narratives are really important. Now, political scientist Eric Selbin, um, he, is, he is a kind of professor in, in, in a uni university in America. Okay, he, he says that stories are the form, even the primary form of socio-political struggle. Okay, another view, John Foran, who is actually a sociologist. Okay, he, he says, revolution is impossible without drawing on a culture of rebellion from widely remembered prior conflicts. So there's this kind of story, a uh, story that's needed for revolutions to happen. And also the idea of narratives and identity, that, uh, this idea that in the fourth generation study of revolutionary movements, uh, they, they identified identity as being really key, one of the key factors in how uh, revolutionary movements form and why they become successful. And the idea that narratives are key to forming identities. Now, if you've read Yuval Noah Harari books, he's really, his books are flying off the shelves. One of his ideas, one of his key ideas is narratives of corporations. So humans are really special above and beyond chimpanzees because we have narratives of corporation. Now, the, uh, really, the question to ask is, 
can we construct a narrative of cooperation for the world? And we think that, that we can. And this is a question that political scientists and sociologists ask, this idea of unifying disparate struggles all over the world, reconciling division. How can we somehow form a kind of universal um, political theory? Uh, uh, the, uh, Fred Frederick Jameson talks about radical universalism. So how do you do it, though? How do you do it? So we're going we're gonna to try and answer this question later on. So, so other thinkers, the missing narrative, Douglas Murray, um, the, the kind of new atheist thinker, uh, he talks about Europe being in a state of existential tiredness, that the story has run out, that, that a new story must be allowed to begin, but he doesn't know what it is. Adam Curtis, the BBC um, documentary maker, calls himself a, a, he's really a left-wing propagandist. He, he says he's a propagandist. In all his documentaries, he talks about the narratives of the political class. They've all fallen down. Existing narratives have all fallen. Some new narrative is needed, but he doesn't know what it is. George Monbo talks about the the kind of uh, restoration narratives. He, he wants to open source the kind of like people to construct the restoration narrative for the 21st century. And Russell Brand talks about this missing unifying myth for humanity. Okay, so, so we think the, the missing story, which satisfies all these five points, that the missing story that enables revolutions that basically that satisfies all these criteria, it's basically the greatest story ever, ever. And you know it, it's the greatest story on, on the planet. Okay, it's, it's, it's a single story, and it's and it's uh, you know it because you know it because you know about Star Wars, you know about Lord of the Rings, the Dune trilogy, um, the Matrix films. It comes up again and again. Harry Potter. It is basically this idea that there is a, a common myth. There's a mythic archetype. There's a mythic story, um, and uh, basically this story is is when it's included in these pop culture classics. Then they become national favorites. They become cult classics. People just can't get them out of their heads. You know, these stories are really powerful. Now that's pop culture, but it, these stories actually reflect, um, okay, uh, traditional myth, myths that underpin entire civilizations. And also importantly, this, this story corresponds perfectly with world, myth world prophecy, the prophecies in the religions of the world. Okay, let me explain. Let me unpack all that. You know all those claims, all that information. So that's the missing story that's going to do all these, all these uh, have all these properties. Uh, so 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 basically, um, so modern mythology. Okay, what we're familiar with is actually a retelling of uh, what's called the monomyth. So basically, it, it is a it, 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 Joseph Campbell was a scholar of mythology, the great scholar of mythology. He basically said that um, in his writings that all the world's myths, Quaxoquotal, King Arthur, um, you name it, kind of all these different myths, the Yellow Emperor, King Charlemagne, they're all basically the retelling of the same story. Now these kind of semi-mythic but semi-historical characters, they, they, their lives go through a stereotypical pattern and it includes in that stereotypical pattern the lives of Jesus, Buddha, and Muhammad, okay? And uh, in a, in a and I think in a quite compelling and convincing way, and uh, the, the, this this monomyth he's distilled into what he's called the myth cycle, and basically uh, he then has communicated this in his books. Now the connection between popular mythology and you know his academic work, the monomyth, is, is not a kind of like a, it's not a weak association. It's very strong because. Okay, we know for a fact that, uh, okay, George Lucas, who wrote Star Wars, he actually said, he said as he was writing Star Wars, he would constantly refer to Joseph Campbell's work as he was writing it. So he's lifting the story into, into Star Wars, literally. Joseph Campbell said, he said the monomyth needed to be communicated to each age and each generation in the new format. And Joseph Campbell said, this is what George Lucas did, okay? So if George Lucas said that was his intention, then there's not a kind of weak link between monomyth and uh, kind of modern mythology. But we find that all myth is like this, that Homer, a writer of the, the, the classic of classics, Iliad and Odysseus, basically borrowed from the existing myths of his time. And all the, the grail legends were reworkings of existing myths. And Lord of the Rings is reworking of Teutonic Norse myths. So it is kind of the same story gets recycled and it, and it sells like, uh, makes popular movies and cult classic books because it's really powerful, okay? But, but this story is also what's behind the most powerful revolutionary movements that have ever appeared on this planet, okay? So, uh, so the idea is basically this story, 
okay, um, historically has been really powerful for revolutionary movements. But if we can resurrect a story in a convincing way using science and put it on firmer foundations, then we can actually use that same storyline, not just for, to make movies and write books, we can use it for political ends. And we find historically this has been done again and again and again. Now in previous talks, I just you know, quickly summarize previous talks, I basically talked about you know, this, this idea of, uh, you know, this idea of um, you know, all these revolutions involve this kind of apocalyptic archetype, which is the same as this monomyth, it's the same story. And uh, Marxism includes it, even as atheist doctrine, it includes it in a kind of, in, in a kind of indirect way via Hegel and certain, certain German thinkers and philosophers before him. And the, the Nazi party was an apocalyptic mass movement. There's a good book called Millennial Right, which describes this in minute detail. And we can go on. So basically, historically, uh, this apocalyptic imagery, this storyline has been used again and again. I explained this in some detail in, in, a, in the previous talk called Revolutionary Movements and How to Start One, which is on YouTube mm -hmm. for a more kind of elaboration on, on this idea, on, on, on this kind of world kind of overview of revolutionary movements, that this kind of story, this mythic prophetic archetype has occurred again and again, has been used in these revolutionary movements. Okay, so we're gonna kind of do a deeper dive into this mono into this monomyth. So what is it? What is the, what is the monomyth? Okay, so um, the storyline that's so important, we're gonna see what it is. So Joseph Campbell basically identified this thing called a myth cycle. And uh, now not all myths have every single element of the myth cycle. And uh, some myths will contain all of it. And, um, but it's a basic storyline, it's like a template. And from this template, you can construct stories and myths and, uh, and best-selling books and best, you know, kind of cult movies. So, so this is what it is. He says, it's basically, he says basically that it starts in a, in, a mo in a kind of period of tranquil, the village or the palace, everything is fine, everything is mellow, all is happy, all is good. Well, something kind of breaks that equilibrium and there's a kind of call to adventure. So, so in Star Wars, it's be Luke Skywalker, kind of like a innocent youth. And then something happens, he sees this kind of starship and then suddenly, you know, this droid kind of calls him to adventure, meets Obi-Wan Kenobi. And there's a call to adventure and this call leads him into this journey, this kind of journey meeting kind of all these enemies and foes and trials and tribulations. So this will be the uh, kind of the journey of Odysseus, the kind of uh, battles of Arjuna, the kind of like uh, the, the sea journey of Captain Ahab and Moby Dick. And there's kind of a whole load of trials and tribulations. And at some point, some, okay, in all these myths, there's something about it's the story. There's something numinous, there's something spiritual, okay? There's a kind of holy grail. And uh, or kind of finding the princess as kind of, you know, historically, the princess has been symbolic, you know, kind of mystical union with the princess has been symbolic for kind of like some kind of like spiritual initiation, like the, you know, Songs of Solomon, and always kind of like, uh, kind of, or Tantra, or just kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, mystical practices of the past have identified the female male meeting as a kind of like union that is a symbol for transcendence, basically. So Odysseus, you know, getting together with his wife Penelope also fits this kind of template. Anyway, this kind of transcendent element, which Joseph Campbell calls the attainment of the experience of the point who, the circle whose point is everywhere, but whose circumference is nowhere. It's like saying the all in all, that there is this kind of all in all, you might call it God. And this, this myth cycle includes this kind of uh, transcendent experience. Hence, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, they all had a little kind of a, a mystical experience under the Bodhi tree, his 40 days in the desert, the night journey, etc. Okay, so this is absolutely essential. And, and I would argue, basically, that these cult classics like Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and uh, Moby Dick, they have this kind of transcendent element. That's why, the, why, you know, Moby Dick, the greatest American novel ever written, without this kind of, you know, kind of like allusion to the mystical, the transcendent, the kind of numinous, then they don't, they're not, they don't become as powerful as they became, all these stories. Okay, so anyway, the, the, the journey continues. The, the grail has to return to Camelot. So the, the, the prize is found and there's a return journey to restore things to the natural order. So they have this kind of battle between forces of good and evil to attain this prize. But then you come back into Camelot and then you have to restore the village. You have to basically complete the myth cycle and the forces of darkness are defeated the orcs are banished agent smith is killed and then back to back to normal and so, so it's, it's a myth cycle and then um camelot is restored excalibur is thrown back into a lake but at some point king arthur will return so it's, it's a myth cycle yeah it goes on and on like you know there's, there's nine star wars movies it's, it's one generation after another generation after another generation 
so um so so that's the basic outline of the mono myth and uh and, and, okay so so it's, it's a story and it's really a story of um of uh, mythology but it, but but mythology also connects with prophecy now here's, here's the really uh, powerful thing for revolutionary movements that really uh we, 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 we'll talk about this a lot more later on but the uh the idea that prophet the prophetic archetype is identical to the mythic archetype it's the same story okay how do we how do we understand mythology on the one hand and prophecy on the other it's basically the same story but projected on a planetary scale so the the roman philosopher Sallustius said that myths are things which never happen but they always are but this these things which never happened is like acts like a transcendent template and these things which never happened they actually manifest in actual life so Luke Skywalker does, they never, never existed, you know, the, uh, the kind of galaxy far, far away, that's all fantasy, but actually myth, the mythic template actually manifests in real life. And uh, these uh, kind of real mythic heroes become like, um, you know, the, 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 they become cult heroes of their culture and their stories get retold as myth. Now, to relate myth to prophecy, it means that basically the prophecies all talk about the time when about global events, the Bible mentions the word earth 60 times, the word world 10 times, the expression whole world four times, global events, world benefactor, world renovator, the kind of uh, the uh, Zoroastrian prophecies, things on a global event, world avatar, etc. the imam, the Mahdi prophecies, the imam who will create a world state. Now, interestingly, uh, the, the prophecies of Islam, imam Mahdi, jihad and stuff, basically the uh, modern myth of Dune is taken straight from the prophecies of Islam. So there's a direct connection between modern mythology, Dune, and, and, and Muslim prophecies for the future state of the planet. Okay, so what we need to do, we need to basically establish the myth cycle in, 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 more, in more solid foundations for our 21st century revolutionary movement, because people say, oh yeah, the myths, who believes in myths and prophecies, who believes in prophecies these days? So we need to kind of establish this more uh, solid foundations. I'm going to go into um, kind of Jordan Peterson terrain, okay? So I'm going to go into kind of Jordan Peterson terrain for a bit, okay? For just a few minutes, okay? I'm not, you know, you know, Jordan. I, I, I sometimes criticize Jordan Peterson, but he says lots of sensible things, and in a sense, he's kind of he's kind of preparing the way for the kind of things I'm talking about because you know, you know, he he's very open to mythology and Joseph Campbell and even psychedelics. He talks about this in, in his in his discussions. So even though he's very against system change, he's very his recurring theme of his message is you shouldn't try and change things because you know you only make, make things worse. But but we believe that basically at the very heart of the monomyth, which he talks about a lot, and uh, you, you know, is essentially revolution and, and change. Okay, so this is kind of uh, Jordan Peterson terrain that the idea that the myth cycle is represented in the normal human life cycle. Okay, so basically these huge myths resonate with us so much because they actually reflect our normal lives. Okay, so, uh, you know, um, corresponding to the myth cycle we talked about before, this is the normal human life cycle. The, the, obviously, the period of tranquil is basically uh, the family home, like, unless you, you know, most normal um, families that are kind of like, if you do things right, then you got happy kids. I had a, you know, a very happy childhood and it was very tranquil. I had my toys, I had my friends. The school was only five minutes walk away. We lived in the same house all my life or age, age four until I left for university. And it was a very tranquil kind of uh, context. But the teens and adolescents, there's a kind of disturbance that happens in your mind. And it's basically you, you have a sexual awakening and then all that kind of like tranquility, your toys, all that you kind of like your happy little infant life as a, as a small child is blown away. Suddenly you have this disturbance. You start to look at your body and my God, you're dissatisfied with your looks. Oh my God, I've got spots on my face. You know, there's a kind of like disturbance in your life. Then you have this kind of awakening. You kind of... Uh, dissatisfaction with childish things and now you want to basically go out into the world and uh you have this kind of idea of basically meeting your perfect partner i mean as a teenager i, I don't know if, if if it is aberrant of course of course it isn't i mean at 16 17 18 all i could think about was sex and meeting girls basically that's the main thing you know at that age right uh, until your kind of mid-20s maybe maybe uh, mid-30s okay Anyway, anyway, so you leave home and basically have the, you have this disturbance where you have to basically kind of find your perfect partner. You have this image of yourself 
but you have to kind of make yourself to some someone you think in your mind this is the man i want to be or the woman you want to be to be good enough to meet your perfect partner and it's a journey i mean some people find it easy some people just you know meet the girls in the early teens have the first family by the time they're in the late teens or in the second family okay it wasn't so easy for me okay so it really was and for a lot of people it's a struggle it's a real struggle to basically make yourself uh, you know i had this idea of going to university i need to basically you know uh, start a computer company there's this idea of uh, figuring out artificial intelligence and, and figuring out how the brain works and creating artificial intelligence steve jobs was my hero back then in my late teens and so you go out into the world and you go on you go out into this adventure okay it, it really is an adventure you basically you're out in the wide world you leave university and it really is something if you if you um really aim for high things then it is a kind of like a road of trials then eventually you get there i mean it took me some time it took me a long, a long time because uh you know i was kind of like a slow developer and then eventually you meet your perfect partner or you meet people and you have children basically okay and then after that um okay someone's, someone's wondering if someone is uh okay so, so after that um, basically, uh, you have this honeymoon period, and basically, all is well, and uh, you, you kind of you're, you're having kids now. You're setting up home, so it's like the return journey. You're returning back to your parents' state, and you set up home, and it's domestic bliss. And basically, and then kids come out, and then the kids grow up, and it's ideal, and it's that kind of so you're back to square one again. So the human life cycle. So that's like a kind of. A, perfect image of the myth myth cycle that's that's what that's a basic idea that the uh the myths aren't, aren't just saying uh, telling talk about mythic heroes they're talking about real life okay so you actually um now we're going to put some more firm foundations because in the second talk we talked about very cosmic things kind of universe on a grand scale you know the entire universe is being purposeful a universe being uh, kind of like fractal as being kind of um mathematical illusory all these kind of mystical ideas but really uh it, it's the myth cycle it is the monomyth that really brings it down to earth okay so uh, we, this is something we're going to fill in now it's basically that the myth cycle and a human life cycle are reflections of the cosmic cycle so this is basically a very simple idea if the universe is fractal okay like the mandelbrot set and the, the mandelbrot snowman that's got infinite number of mandelbrot snowmen in the mandelbrot set we're like the mandelbrot snowman but the thing is um life is a process okay if life is fractal then basically that fractal is a process then that process should be reflected in our lives okay so it's not a static thing is it okay so the idea is basically um the human life cycle reflects the cosmic life cycle and this is also reflected in the myth cycle but the mythic hero doesn't just set up, set up home and have kids he basically creates an entire civilization or a new age or a new camelot okay so that's the basic idea now let's, let's go through this fairly quickly okay the, the universe we kind of like uh, talked about the universe being cyclical and the idea of this kind of a time inversion okay that, that came from results in quantum mechanics uh, string theory and loop quantum gravity Let, let's let's go through this in more detail Okay, okay, this diagram is supposed to represent one time cycle. So, so this basically, this is like the big bang here. Okay, I'll shake my cursor around here. And this is kind of like expansion of the universe and uh, matter just expands everywhere. Now, this kind of, you see this kind of, uh, this side of the diagram, it's basically just things coming together. You see kind of like it comes together into this, this circle here where every, all matter has basically converged to like a single life form. Like, uh, if you go back to this diagram here, um, this idea of emanation from a point, a human being emanates from a fertilized egg, and all those cells divide and split up, and then things come together, bones, sinews, nerves, and the skin bind us together into a human being, that humanity begins from these points that spread out into the universe, into, onto the planet. And then, you know, through these kind of like tribes, confederations, kingdoms, Kind of trade blocks, etc. The world is becoming one place. It's a very disharmonious world right now. Clash of civilizations and kind of like all these kind of people in kind of uh, uneasy juxtaposition. But the idea is eventually it will all become one unified humanity. That's the dream, isn't it? That's the hope. And so, fractally, that the idea that this point explodes into the universe, and then you have this kind of you know matter becomes molecules, macromolecules biological chemicals uh you know um biochemistry becomes life dna becomes cell animals multicellular animals king tribes kingdoms etc trade blocks one world orders galactic animals galactic beings 
you know, multi-galactic beings to the entire cosmic Christ, etc. So, so the diagram here is supposed to represent the convergence, that convergence on a cosmic scale. Okay, so that's the Big Bang, and that's the eventual coming together of the cosmic Christ. And because uh, in the last talk we talked about this time inversion, uh, basically when the cosmic Christ appears, then that is the time flip. If the Big Bang was the big, big bounce, then the, basically the uh, the next epoch is a mirror image of this epoch. You know, this this epoch involves all matter converging to one one cosmic being. Then the next uh, kind of uh, after that, through mirror symmetry, because it's a mirror image, then that unified thing becomes dissolved into separate separateness. So this is a recurring myth that, um, you, you know, Marduk and uh, that uh, Babylonian myth that the kind of like, uh, the, the kind of like, the, the kind of like, uh, I guess, the female deity whose body gets chopped up and becomes a universe, a recurring uh, idea that the, uh, the, the, the God becomes, the God man becomes self-sacrificed, and then the kind of body of God becomes a universe and the universe becomes God again. That's a recurring thing also in Hindu mythology and Hindu metaphysics. So this idea that then the, the other side of this time cycle involves the dissolution of the completed cosmic Christ into this kind of like, uh, into little bits and that li those little bits get sucked into back to the singularity, back to the big bounce for the next cycle to begin. So the next cycle, big, big, uh, big, big bounce, the big bang, and then uh, the, the cycle begins again. So basically that's the same diagram, but in a cyclical form. Now if we go back to uh, our, our, our diagram here, it means that basically that cycle is represented in this myth cycle. It means that the cosmic cycle reflecting myth cycle and, and life cycle means that that's the, the, I guess the, before the big bang singularity, all is really non-dual, it's non-duality, all is one, all is peace. It's the cosmic egg. And then it, it, it basically explodes into this kind of zim zum, the contraction, basically that which is oneness has become fallen into duality. The demiurge has been created, something which is not of the totality of God has emerged. And that explodes into the universe. And then eventually that universe becomes God again. And that involves this cosmic battle. So that, that involves this kind of like the, the, the struggle of evolution, the dialectic. Eventually, um, you have to get this coming together process to form a oneness of the universe. And then, that, okay, so this is the time inversion, and this is the emanations of God. The oneness of God emanates, breaks up into little bits, and those little bits get sucked up back into the cosmic egg again, back to this resting state of, of non duality. Okay, so, so you know, uh, we, we can, uh, in the future, we'll give an entire talk about this, uh, you know, bridging this cosmological picture to the mythic uh, myth cycle and the human life cycle. But you get the picture, you get the, the idea that the, um, the, we are made in the image of God, but the image of God is not a static thing. It is actually a process. And this process is captured perfectly in our lives. But not perfectly, I mean, it's reflected in our lives, I should say. Sometimes it is you know, done more perfectly than other times, but the process is all reflected in the myth cycle. That's the basic idea, okay. So what we think we can do is, is to um, add this to the second talk uh, on the unification of science and religion and say that basically this is the kind of like template of life, basically, of the human life and of the prophecies and of mythology. So we kind of put it on firmer foundations for the 21st century. We kind of kind of build on the kind of all the Jordan Peterson stuff. And really, the, the thing about Jordan Peterson is he's shown that basically there is a real appetite for this kind of thing. So, so there's a real kind of like uh, his popularity, I think, is partly that he um, kind of addresses the kind of numinous. He's actually sympathetic to the idea that the Bible contains truth. So I think this is a, something which I think the, the way the world is going, that will become more and more a, a kind of thing that will become entering the mainstream. Okay, now, okay, now, um, okay, so that's the basic storyline, okay, resurrected for the 21st century. The, the idea that we can resurrect the idea of the mythic archetype and put it on firmer foundations and resurrect the idea that, you know, the prof prophecies is essentially this mythic archetype manifesting on the entire planet. So we're kind of like, uh, we, we're, say, we're saying basically, if this storyline was used in the past for revolutionary movements, we say we can resurrect it for the 21st century to create a kind of like revolution, not just for, you know, the West, for, in this diagram here, I'm sharing in England, France, America, in, in Europe, 
and uh, but also for the entire world, for, for China to even um, something that the Chinese Communist Party can understand for, for uh, Islam also. OK, now um, we're going to go into more specifics now. So that's quite, quite it's still quite abstract. We're talking kind of quite big picture stuff. I mean, cosmic cosmic templates and, you know, kind of like, you know, human life cycles and this cycles. We're going to kind of like a, like a, make it more concrete and actually really go into uh, more detail about what revolutions involve. OK, so um, in past talks, we've talked about how this, uh, you know, prophetic mythic archetype is incorporated into these past revolutionary movements. But we're going to, we're going to do a deeper dive into all the different ways that system change happens. Okay, so, so this diagram here, the many paths of system change, we're going to relate this kind of the abstract discussions we've had so far into more concrete historical examples that we can then use for templates to do system change for the 21st century. So make it more kind of like, um, yeah, make it more concrete, I suppose, by using historical examples. Now, um, the, the, the talks we've done in the past really is, is uh, point two. Uh, the talks I've done has really been the big revolutions involving revolutionary armies, okay, civil wars and kind of like uh, military, revolutionary militia. We'll, we'll go through these points in, in, in turn because these, these are kind of all the ways or, you know, I, 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 can, uh, I know of so far. It's just, it's, it might not be totally comprehensive. It's just basically listing many different ways that, real system change happens and i think some of these um ways might not be so familiar for, with people because they're, they're not so well known okay so let me go through the, them in in um point by point now the first um kind of uh what people think of a system change and a revolutionary movement is is really uh, points one and two now um a lot of uh revolutions or system change movements really focus on point one and i think this is a real, real weakness because um when academics sociologists and political scientists when they say all these dozens of hundreds of social movements that have appeared in the past few decades in the latter part of the 20th century and in more recent times uh, they talk about basically that all these uh, social movements they don't actually produce any change at all or hardly any deep change and some uh, academics even say that the age of great revolution, the stuff that happened in France in the American Revolution, English Civil War, they, they are things of the past, that real system change, deep, deep level system change can't happen in the 21st century. So academics actually say that explicitly. OK, so, um, you know, this is uh, something which we're familiar with, protests, civil disobedience. This is what Extinction Rebellion do very well, OK, and uh, very, in a very committed way, even riots and rallies and marches. Yes, they, they do produce, uh, they can topple regimes, they can, uh, you know, change policies, they can, uh, they can even uh, institute democracies, they can even do, uh, but fundamentally, they can't change things. Let, let, me, let me explain, let me explain this. Um, in Egypt, um, basically, there, there was the Arab Spring revolutions a, a, a decade or so ago, and they managed to topple the, the military dictatorship, okay, and they instituted democracy. That, you think... That system change, isn't it? Well, no, because uh, who got in power were the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, they, they, one fair and square didn't get absolute democracy, but the, the, the majority of Egyptian people were so against uh, fundamentalist Islam, they had to have another revolution to abolish the, the democratically elected government to restore the military dictatorship. Okay, so, so, so you see, uh, there was zero system change, even though they managed to topple the regime and install for a time democracy, you see, without a, a, a coherent alternative or worldview to replace what they were against, nothing changed. Okay, um, Syriza in Greece uh, kind of uh, got to power, you know, one fair and square got, got, on a, a plat got, to, got to power on a platform of uh, abolishing austerity. But without a worldview, without changing the worldview, the kind of context in which they're operating, operating in, they ended up kind of uh, in their policies actually implementing even more draconian austerity than the people they opposed. <laughs> so, okay, so all these kind of like existing social movements not, don't just uh, not change anything, they can actually make things even worse than the thing they were trying to oppose. Now, this sounds very paradoxical, doesn't it? So you can see why these political scientists are saying all these recent protest movements are really not doing anything. The system doesn't change. Okay, 
And as argued in the first talk, it's still worldview. It's, it's not to just do having a list of demands and a con you know, new constitution, a new manifesto, a kind of you know, one issue like you know, climate change, ecological destruction, or whatever, left-wing movements or right-wing movements. You've got to have an entire worldview. And we, we kind of like really banged on the idea that you really had to challenge the existing cosmological metaphysical assumptions of the modern age. Okay, so point two, okay, we move on to point two of uh, revolutionary armies, militia and terrorism. Now, this is very hard to do because in modern industrialized countries, it's very hard to, um, to uh, you know, start an armed insurrection. And many people are against it. I mean, why? Why should, you know, many people don't want to do that because, you know, especially in uh, modern industrialized uh, economies, uh, basically, there is a kind of level of development, which makes, makes it impossible anyway. And also, it's uh, many people are against violence, so you, you, you don't really want to do this. And also, I mean, okay, we, we kind of move the point forward because one uh, social movement we t we talk about um, a, a, fair, a fair amount is the, basically the NSDAP, uh, okay, Nazi Party. They actually tried armed insurrection. That's their first attempt. It literally ended in a hail of bullets, and they saw the senselessness even in you know Weimar Germany. It, this is not going to work, okay. And uh, they actually got to power through the ballot box. So we've got to jump to point four in that you can, yes, you can um, gain uh, power through elections. And the, the, the Nazi party never gained an absolute majority, but largely through the ballot box, they gained power. Now it's said that the, the Nazi party gained power to start a revolution. Instead of the other way around, he's starting a revolution to gain power, they're not knowing what to do. But the Nazis had a very well-developed worldview, okay. And that's abhorrent. It's not going to work for the 21st century, but they had a worldview, and, and they attempted to reform German society, and they, and they did to a very large extent. Okay, um, so okay, so uh, points two and four really talk about the difficulty in uh, the modern context, even Weimar Germany, you, you know, in industrialized countries, of actually uh, doing d d armed insurrections, basically. So I, I don't recommend this at all. Obviously, I, I, don't, I don't endorse terrorism at all. But uh, historically, this is how people did system change, okay? So, so I'm not, I'm just, you know, including that for completeness, basically. Okay, now point three, okay, this is, uh, this is probably um, a surprise to many people. Revolutions of the bourgeoisie. Now, now, hang on, uh, isn't it uh, bourgeoisie, aren't they the enemy of the revolutions? Isn't it proletariats versus the bourgeoisie? Is that a revolution? Well, no, 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 no. If you actually understand the history, that's not the case. Now, now Switzerland, uh, the reforms in Switzerland, which created the modern state, which really abolished uh, feudal um, feudalism, basically, the rule by landed elites, the revolution was led by the bourgeoisie, petty bourgeoisie, led by the capitalists. That's what, it, what happened. Now, Karl Marx studied and really was interested in the revolutions that happened in early 19th century Switzerland. And in fact, in Das Kapital, he writes at length about the watch, Swiss watch industry and, and the, how, how it worked. But basically, it was uh, basically these uh, artisans and uh, kind of people involved in Swiss industry, which really spearheaded the revolution that really brought about um, modern Switzerland. And, uh, you know, it's, it, what, modern Switzerland is not a bad place. Now, now, Karl Marx really uh, admired these people. He, he, now, now, he learned three things. He wrote that he learned three things from studying the Swiss revolutions. He learned, okay, firstly, they came from the middle classes. And, uh, okay, he also learned that, uh, okay, he learned that they came from the middle classes and they were able to do the revolution because they had resources, they were educated, they had capital behind them, okay. Secondly, he was encouraged because he, he saw that revolutions can happen in, in, the, in the 19th century context. But thirdly, most importantly, he learned that people get involved in revolutions, not necessarily to be against something, but people do revolutions for something. So it's not rebelling against the previous uh, feudal order or whatever. It is, they were actually, the main reason why they were re rebelling was they, they were kind of basically trying to institute a better order Okay, that, that's, that's what he learned. Now, Engels hated uh, the, the Swiss revolutionaries. He thought they were bourgeoisie, okay, petty bourgeoisie, and uh, he didn't, didn't trust them. And they returned the favor because they really uh, despised um, communism. They, they embraced John Locke, Adam Smith, and direct democracy. So that's one example of a revolution that really changed uh, Switzerland to create something really good and it actually came from the middle classes. Now, this is not something unique to Switzerland because uh, 
I mean, Peter, Peter Turchin, who basically wrote an interesting uh, paper for, for Nature magazine, Precision Science magazine, that caused a lot of discussion, because he said basically that revolution was imminent in the Western world. And he said the main factor for revolution, this caused a lot of discussion 10 years ago, and, and currently, yeah, uh, currently now, he said basically it was really the, uh, the, the, the having too many uh, graduates who can't find their place in society, either unemployed or they can't satisfactorily get a, a kind of leg on the ladder. And these are the people who really spearhead revolutions. He says basically the West is imminently heading for a revolution because there's too many people with advanced graduate degrees, very smart people who are basically not finding their place in society. Now after COVID, I mean, there's, there's tons and tons of very smart graduates who can't even find a job. So. You know, if 10 years ago, um, his, his paper was uh, actively discussed as, uh, you know, kind of like raising the possibility of some dramatic change to happen, then obviously now with uh, what's happened with the coronavirus, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, something is, is brewing, isn't it? Anyway, okay, so point three, revolutions that really do change the status quo and create amazing things can actually happen from the middle classes and the bourgeoisie, petty bourgeoisie. Okay, we discussed a revolution via the ballot box. It is possible, but the, the idea is that you need a worldview. You need a plan in order to, to do it. So even like Syriza get voted in and do perversely, you know, even worse than what they were rebelling against. And, uh, we, you know, we, we discussed the, the Muslim Brotherhood and the, 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 the Arab Spring revolutions in Egypt. Okay, no, 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 point five. Okay, this is... Um, this is a very important point that a recent book called The Nordic Secret. Okay, uh, very good book. I mean, the two authors, um, they, they are now been um, promoted to the Club of Rome for their efforts. So someone's taking notice. Anyway, their, their, um, their book Nordic Secret um, basically says that the reason why the Scandinavian countries do so well um, industrially in, in terms of living, you know, livability index, human development index, in terms of niceness, in terms of happiness index, is because something happened in the 19th century and that basically it was an educational revolution. Now, importantly, the educational revolution, they, they call it Volk Bildung. Bildung means education, it means a holistic education. And it came from uh, the word build, Bildung. It came from a German word, and the German word has um, spiritual, mystical roots. And the word build, bildung, actually means initially, it meant to shape yourself in the image of God. Okay. Now, um, they also recognize that basically the Nordic secret was based on the educational ideas derived from uh, uh, educators and also uh, philosophers, uh, romantic German-speaking philosophers, and basically the ideas created this idea of holistic education that everyone had a sense of self-responsibility that basically education is holistic that basically um is, is an ongoing thing that there's a perfecting of the person through education in all it, it all the dimensions of what a person is but most importantly what they recognize also that most of the protagonists in this form, form formulation of the nordic secret they were freemasons okay so basically, the Nordic secret is essentially adapted Freemasonry for the masses. Isn't that, that sounds really funny, doesn't it? That sounds really strange. Um, well, well not, not if you realize that basically what the, the, the Freemason idea is, is basically shaping yourself in the image of God. So back to the first and second talks, the Corpus Hermeticum, this idea of basically recognizing that you are in the image of God, that somehow you can work yourself into that image. So, so really, what they're saying is basically that, um, that the revolutions that happened that made uh, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and they also include Switzerland in their analysis, is essentially ideas from Freemasonry, from, from um, German Romantic philosophers, most of whom were Freemasons, and they're saying basically this is what caused the transition from uh, these Nordic countries, from poor agrarian backward countries into kind of industrial educational powerhouses okay of, of the 21st 20, 21st century so that's kind of a revolution from uh, education uh, educational perspective now okay the, the point six is probably the most controversial uh, point to make for uh people interested in revolution because this, this sounds like a complete like a perverse idea um it's idea that revolution comes from above and then let me, let me explain i know some some of you are kind of really kind of like uh, gonna be alienated by this idea at first but let me explain what it is okay 
it's the idea that, uh, okay, the idea that kings can sometimes become the revolutionary. Okay, you know, Hegel, the philosopher, we talked a lot about young Hegelians and left Hegelians, the ideas, the, the, the people who followed the ideas of young Hegel, which were absolutely revolutionary. We also talked, we also kind of uh, talked about the idea of, but we didn't talk so much about what it was, the ideas of the right Hegelians or the ideas of old Hegel, okay. So, so what, it, what, it, what it is is that Hegel shifted his perspective from a real revolutionary perspective of armed insurrection. He really admired the French Revolution and Napoleon. But later, later on in his life, he really abandoned all that. He says he saw the excesses of the French Revolution, the terror, the bloodshed, the, the kind of like uh, the, the killings and stuff, and lots, lots of academics. He basically rejected all that. But then, then he said basically uh, that the Prussian monarchy was the ideal form of political organization. That's right Hegelism. Hege Hegelianism. Okay. Or, or, or. Now, for years, I thought Hegel had gone mad. I didn't really pay much attention to this. I thought just yeah, he's gone, he's gone insane. He's gone senile, basically. And uh, so I didn't really pay much attention to it. So I recognised, you know, that the left Hegelian ideas influenced Karl Marx and and communism and stuff, and led to these revolutions happening. But but there is some sense in what he's saying. Okay, I don't. I'm, I'm not going to advocate right he Hegelism. I'm not going to advocate it because you sound like a complete idiot for, to most people. Okay. But he, there's some sense, and here, here's where the sense is, okay, basically, Frederick, Fre Frederick II, okay, who was the, the monarch around his time, just before Hegel was around, and Frederick II was basically, actually, they were, they were, they were con contemporaneous, uh, Fred Frederick II, the uh, King of Prussia, was also called Frederick the Great, and he is acknowledged as one of the most enlightened monarchs of all European history. Now, he actually... It's almost as if the revolutionary became the king. He instituted all those things that revolutionaries sought to, in, to, uh, to institute, like egalitarianism. So he let uh, people who are non-Prussian monarchy, non-Prussian aristocrats become part of the civil service. He, he instituted meritocracy, equality, and he, he advocated freedom of the press, free speech. So all these things that uh, we kind of associate with kind of liberal enlightened views of society, the king instituted. Now, the thing about Frederick II was he was a Freemason. Okay, so he basically, uh, we talked about Freemasons spearheading the American, French, and also even the English Revolution, the, the overall commander of the parliamentary forces, uh, Thomas Lord Fairfax, was a Freemason. Um, basically, it's almost as if the revolutionary became the king. So there's, there's kind of sense, there's, there is some sense in what Hegel was saying. And uh, uh, three of the, the, the Frederick Wilhelms that follow, followed Frederick II were also Freemasons, less enlightened maybe, but he, the general idea is basically, um, there's a certain set of ideas in Freemasonry to do with equality, to do with these kind of um, the uh, Renaissance values we talked about in the first talk. And they became an underground vehicle for the championing of these values. And to a very large extent, these uh, Freemason societies were able to push these values into European life. I'm not, I'm not going to make any comments about modern day Freemasonry. I'm not going to you know, get caught in these, these discussions of Illuminati and stuff. I don't know, basically. I, I, but I'm saying historically, the Freemasons did a lot of good. Now, funny, um, you know, Free, Freemasons write to me and they ask me things like when, when the Dan Brown novel came out, um, what was it? I can't remember the exact name, it, 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 which kind of like had this Freemason character trying to become a god. And lots of Freemasons are writing to me saying, what, Lost Symbol, that's the book. Uh, at that time, uh, 10 years ago, writing to me saying, uh, wait, is, is this really, uh, I found your website, is this really what Freemasons believe? And, uh, you know, so, so um, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it really is. And uh, recently, I, I noticed an old email, uh, and it was a, a young man who um, uh, wrote to me, and he said, uh, this is on academia.co, he said, yeah, love your work, and said, basically, and I can't help asking, he says, I'm a young Freemason, and he says, he asked me, this is so funny, he says, uh, in a half joking way, he, say, he says, are you a 32nd or 33rd degree Freemason? Uh, well, I would say, no, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. But that's quite a funny, funny thing. I, 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 I thought that's really, really funny. Um, okay, basically, I'm not a Freemason. But what I'm saying is, uh, Freemasonry became a vehicle for those ideas that appeared during the Renaissance, and they actually implemented those ideas in their lodges and in their political life and leading these revolutions. So I, I would say that basically, I am totally into those ideas but I might not be so much into Freemasonry. And many of the Freemasons um, you know, mentioned in the Nordic Secret actually um, despised the, the kind of lodge life. They actually you know, lost 
faith in the, the Freemasonry anyway. So I would say I'm into the ideas of Freemasonry, but not necessarily into the organization. Um, it's, it's right for some people, maybe not right for me. Anyway, that's, uh, that's another thing. But anyway, in all these kind of like, uh, you know, points one to six, okay, there, there is a recurring theme and it's basically to do with uh, worldview. Okay, that these, the Nordic secret and the, the, the idea of revolution above, they were basically implementing, they, they happen to be Freemasons, but they're implementing a worldview that emerged from the Renaissance. And uh, th th these points also reflect what happens when you don't have a worldview, when you don't know what your revolution is gonna cause. And then basically you're in trouble because what you might bring about is really um, something you might not like, like the you know the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. The people really were so against it; they had to start another re revolution to remove democracy and re remove the Muslim Brotherhood. And so the idea is basically that yes, um, worldview really starts these uh, kind of like uh, the worldview from the Renaissance really starts all these revolutions. But if you don't have a worldview, if you don't have the kind of big picture, then okay, firstly your your revolutions really peter out your 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 kind of uh social movements you're kind of like uh, all these kind of like grassroots movements they they come to nothing really so we're kind of back to the first talk you know all these kind of thinkers left-wing thinkers saying basically you need this ideological framework you need kind of like some narrative you need some kind of ideas behind your kind of your, your social movements i mean i mean civil disobedience i really respect and, and admire um many many of the um what extinction rebellion do because i'm really into uh, kind of eco matters and stuff and really into ecology i grew up in Ipswich. a very important part of my life was nature basically so i love the natural world and it's really a tragedy what's happening and obviously i've got kids environmental ecological catastrophe is good for nobody so i really respect what they're doing but without a kind of plan without a kind of like uh you know having in place the alternative of what you're trying to bring down or change then nothing's going to happen so one thing i really um uh, thought was a mistake was this idea of citizens assemblies okay so the mistake was basically that um if you t take a random sample of people in the uk they're not going to be like the people in stroud basically so and then uh, and then when uh kind of like gail bradbrook went on tv parliamentary committee saying uh, she was asked by a member of parliament you know, you, you know gail you're kind of championing citizens assemblies but the citizens assembly doesn't give you what you want are you going to go back to the streets and protest and she said yeah well the thing is if you don't have a plan you leave it to the citizens assemblies and uh if you're not going to abide by the decision of the citizens assembly then why should anyone else abide by the decision of the citizens assembly so it was basically a non-starter so i'd say basically without a plan without, without kind of like uh, something in place to put in that specific that's going to get you what you want and that's actually you know comprehensive they're basically like the kind of Arab Spring revolutions, like Syriza. Basically, you're, you're not going to cause any change whatsoever. And it's futile kind of like exercise. OK, so. Um, OK, the next next uh, just going to deep dive into uh, deep dive into oh, oh, time's getting on the, the revolutions of the United Kingdom. OK, so. so um, OK, sad UK who've lost the recent football match versus Italy. I mean, it's a uh, really. Um, Seriously, I walked to the post office yesterday. People, I could see people's faces were long. You know, really, people were sad, <laughs> really sad. I live quite central, so I live quite in central London. So I walked to the post office, and it's you know right near Euston and King's Cross, the uh, post office depot, and I, and I saw the England fans going to get their trains back north of England. Yeah, and uh, my God, it was like it's like uh, you could, it's like tragic. It was like like really like a, like a funeral. It's like you know people were just depressed. My God. I, I don't know, football, I mean, some people, it means lots of people. Anyway, the revolutions of the United Kingdom. So we're going to do a deeper dive into England. Okay, so to my American friends, and, uh, you know, this is just uh, focusing on UK, but it extrapolates to everywhere else. So, so basically, we're, we're going to just go into more detail into England. Uh, we just, we just fairly quickly because uh, time is getting on. Um, okay, the, the revolutions of the United Kingdom. Okay, basically, um, the 16th century was where, where it all happened. Where basically you had you know, feudalism, and then you had a uh, kind of rule of monarchs. But then you had this kind of uh, glorious revolution, English Civil War. Okay, so literally, literally, this was a war of worldviews. Okay, literally, you got okay pitch battle. You got two armies. Okay, you got you got cavaliers and you have roundheads. Okay. Now, okay, so you have one side loyal to the king and one side loyal to parliament. 
But when you understand what happened, it's literally a war of worldviews. Because as we discussed in the first talk, the, uh, the idea of you know, the, the great chain of being, this cosmic chain of being, and the divine right of kings to rule, that was basically a cosmological, metaphysical uh, idea that kept, kept kings in place for many centuries in Europe. That's, that's not you know, debated, but that's kind of uh, accepted, that what held stability in Europe was this great chain of being and the divine right of kings to rule. Now, the, the fact of the matter is, okay, the Cavaliers, they were Church of England. So they believed in the Church of England and they believed in the great chain of being and the, the divine right of kings to rule. And the Stuart King, James I, appealed to the great chain of being and the divine right of kings to rule. Now, okay, so that's one worldview. Now, the, the Roundheads were Puritans. They weren't Church of England. So obviously they didn't believe in the divine right of kings to rule. They believed in equality, liberty, fraternity, and you know, the hastening the coming of, second coming of Christ and building the millennial kingdom. So basically, it was literally, you had a pitch battle, but you see, it was literally a war of worldviews. One side believed one thing in their heads, and the other side believes another thing. So li literally, that's what the, uh, the English Civil War was. So the New Model Army were all Puritans. They were all kind of basically uh, apocalyptic Puritans. Cromwell, as well, believed in hastening the coming of Christ. That's, that's what he thought he was doing. And, and Thomas Lord Fairfax was a Freemason. So um, there was this kind of heavy Freemason aspect to the revolutions in, in uh, United Kingdom, also obviously in America, George Washington, who was actually introduced into Freemason by the Fairfax family uh, a branch in, in America. And you know, the, the French Revolution is also spearheaded by Freemason when we talked about the Nordic secret and Frederick II. Okay, now, now point three, okay, is uh, really important because it does relate to the Nordic secret in a way. Uh, the um, Italian, um, noted Italian historian, He's really good, um, Pablo, Paolo Rossi, okay, he wrote, he wrote in his book, uh, the, the Quest for the Universal Language, okay, he wrote uh, basically that 16th, 17th, sorry, mid-17th century England was influenced by, massively influenced by three things, he said basically those three things were, okay, firstly, the intellectual life of 17th century in, uh, England was influenced by, by three things, they were, okay, Francis Bacon, okay, hugely influential, his uh, New Atlantis was really uh, the, the inspiration for um, the Royal Society. And many people say even the, the, the founding fathers of America and uh, the people who first settled America, in, you know, they were basically, they read his New Atlantis. And uh, so Francis Bacon, hugely influential. Okay, the second, the, the, um, the, the scientific method that emerged and these enlightenment values of rationality and reason and empiricism basically uh, also related to Francis Bacon's work. Now, now the third factor he identified was a guy called Amos Comenius. And you think, what, what is that? I mean, we were never taught this in school. Who, who, is, who the hell is Amos Comenius? Well, he is a, a, a kind of what is a Czechoslovakia now, but it was kind of Holy Roman Empire. He was basically an educator. And he was one of the people who um, brought this idea of pan-Sophism to England. And pan-Sophism is an educational concept. It's the idea of that all things should be taught to all people. So he was, was an educator. He's, he's credited with really popularizing the idea of, of having diagrams and textbooks. We, we take that for granted, don't we? Textbooks have diagrams in it. But he systematized this in, in 17th century uh, England. Well, anyway, he, he's, his uh, mentor was, um, it was actually a very famous Rosicrucian. So he was a Rosicrucian. His mentor was, was a very famous Johann Valentin Andrea, who claimed to write the Rosicrucian Manifesto in, in the latter part of his life, you know, close to his death. Uh, he, he had to say it later on because, uh, you know, one of the points of the Rosicrucian Manifesto was abolition of monarchy in, in a Europe which was ruled by monarchs. So anyway, it, it is plausible that his mentor wrote the uh, Rosicrucian Manifesto. But anyway, Amos Comenius, it is another massive influence on uh, 17th century life. And in a sense, the Nordic secret, this idea of, uh, you know, this kind of uh, all things to be taught to all people, this kind of a holistic education was something that actually penetrated into England as well. So you have these amazing ideas, but they need to spread. They need to spread for education, not just through Freemason lodges, but through pamphlets and books and stuff. So Amos Comenius is credited as a really important factor by Paolo Rossi. And now, okay, we can we can go on to include these really uh, these are these are all mystical um, apocalyptic movements and religions that emerge in the 17th century. 
levelers, Quakers, shakers, ranters, seekers, diggers, fifth monarchy men. Okay, Quakers, shakers, and ranters, they basically quaked and shaked and ranted because they were receiving the spirit of God. Okay, now, now Quakerism, when, when you, know, uh, you know, like the book Moby Dick, most of the protagonists are Quakers. Uh, not, not now, but in, in historically, they refer to each other as the and Tao. Uh, you know, you see the movie Moby Dick, it's the and Tao. It's like in India, they say namast, which means I address the God in you. So when they say the and Tao, they're like addressing God. So it's, it's, it's a very kind of mystical idea that they're addressing the God within. So, you know, early Quakerism was far more mystical and, and also apocalyptic. They believed in the imminent coming of Christ. Now, the, the, the mysticism and apocalypticism of, of a few generations later kind of got pushed more in the background and kind of disappeared. But at the beginning, um, basically, the Shakers, Ranters, and Quakers were quaking with the Spirit of God. That's why they've given these nicknames. There really were. And the Seekers were seeking after. Many of the Seekers became Quakers, and uh, many of the Quakers became Ranters. There's a kind of intersection of ideas. And the levelers, diggers, and the uh, levelers were hugely influential with the new model army. Many of the new model army were also levelers as well. And uh, the diggers were, the, the, these are all kind of like apocalyptic movements who read the Bible in the popular vernacular. And what it took away, were, away was this mystical element, this kind of like communal element, and also this kind of, um, this, yeah, this apocalyptic hastening the coming of Christ mystical element, which really uh, made these movements, uh, you know, gave, gave them their power. That's what they were about. We could also include later on the romantic uh, poet William Blake and the New Jerusalem. Like many people of his time, he thought that the New Jerusalem, now the hymn Jerusalem is not about the past, okay, it's actually about the future. That William Blake, like many of the, uh, his contemporaries, thought that the New Jerusalem, the apocalypse, the great happening would happen in London. So what we have in England is basically this whole set of like, uh, like reform ideas of revolution, ideas of a new society, new Jerusalem, influenced by these apocalyptic and mystical ideas. You can say that you know, all these elements, uh, the English Civil War, were driven by apocalyptic, apocalyptic imagery, hastening the coming of Christ, free, Freemasonry, the mysticism of Freemasonry, et cetera, Rosicrucianism. And, and these kind of more popular kind of uh, spiritual movements. And of course, William Blake, the, the mystic, and the, the, uh, the, he's said to be England's only prophet. Now, why am, I, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because another key idea that many political scientists and sociologists believe is necessary for revolutions to happen is that one, yes, you need a narrative, the story that causes revolutions, which we talked about earlier, uh, to do with this um, mythic, quest hero archetype, this prophetic archetype. Uh, but, but what's really important is that you have to root your reform and revolutionary movement in what's called existing narratives, existing kind of cultures of rebellion. So what it means is that if you're going to start some kind of massive reform revolutionary movement in England, in the UK, you have to talk in terms of these past revolutions and these past uh, kind of movements. Now, the people do this already, you know, New Seekers, okay, New Seekers is a pop band, but, you know, the new levelers, new diggers, these ideas are used anyway. But what we propose, you be more systematic, you have to frame all these uh, kind of like past movements, you have to project them into the modern, modern world, basically. So if you're going to start some kind of like reform, revolutionary movement in the UK, this is the context you use to, to do it. And uh, every society has its own revolutionary background, uh, you know, stories of revolution. Funnily, uh, funnily uh, you know, the actual English revolution itself um, basically used what was current at that time. So while the English Civil War or Glorious Revolution was happening, in their propaganda, they used this idea of the, the Norman yoke. Okay, we are we're like Saxons rebelling against the Normans. They use it in their propaganda. So they, they, they dredged up past struggles of rebellion against the Normans for propaganda purposes to create an, a revolutionary narrative to, together with the apocalyptic narrative to drive you know, the, 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 the aims forward. Now, no one, no one uh, has any sympathy with the idea of the Norman yoke anywhere, or you know, no, one, no one has any notion of uh, the, the people don't really think about being dominated by Normans anymore, uh, you know, 400 years later. Um, 
funnily, funnily, uh, most of the uh, uh, commanders of the uh, kind of um, the, the Puritan armies, um, the, the Oliver Cromwell himself, Lord Fairfax, they were all actually uh, Norman descent. <laughs> so funny, they used the propaganda of the Norman yoke, even though they were actually Normans themselves. Okay, that's a, but anyway, for propaganda, for, for, for purposes of basically trying to, um, you know, cause change to happen, you need the storyline that's rooted in the history of the people you're trying to get to, to reform society. So that's the um, that's the takeaway. Time has really flown. I, I, I think I'll take some questions. I'll take some questions now before I just uh, kind of uh, go on to um, to do the the, the kind of uh, conclusion of the talk. So uh, talk. My God, I talked for one hour, ten minutes. That that felt like half an hour, but it, it's it's uh, time really flies when you're having fun. Okay, any questions? I wonder. Uh, this is Matt. Uh, I've got a question. All right, so uh, you talked about like the mythic ar archetype and you know the monomyth and all these revolutionary movements. Uh, but do you have any uh, ideas how to implement these ideas for the 21st century? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, Matt, we're going to talk about in the next part of the talk. Uh, all right. I mean, it, it is, it is, uh, you know, the, the actual. I mean, I mean. Really, really, what we've done is really talk about the past. Really, I mean, I mean, okay, the, the four things we need to the reform of all knowledge. Okay, science stays the same, mathematics stays the same, um, most things stay the same. What we for for political purposes, what we need to reform is four areas that that missing narrative. So we resurrect the mythic prophetic archetype. We also reinterpret the past. So what we've done, you, you know, we spent a good most of the talk so far just dredging up the past, past revolutionary movements. So, so um, the next next stage of the talk is really to then to translate that into the twenty first century. Okay, okay. So, any other questions? Any other? Okay, I, I think I think we just basically roll on, and I think we just basically roll on to the next part of the talk. Okay, so uh, okay, so so um, you 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 you're asking people to do something really quite quite you know like maybe slightly risky and also something really hard to do and uh, the advantage of having the uh, kind of having your kind of like um i guess movement rooted in the past is that it gives people a sense of familiarity and also um we, okay, okay in terms of implementing this for the 21st century it gives you direct blueprints of what happened in the past okay we're not going to like uh, you know start a new model new model army for the 21st century and you know march around england with pikes and Kind of iron helmets you know we can't extrapolate from the history to the modern world in in that sense but we can really take these ideas especially the educational ideas especially the kind of like uh the kind of um you know taking tradition and actually appealing even to freemasons and actually um to uh to people who respect tradition and maybe are suspicious of change now the thing is the thing is the way the, the benefit of this way of doing things by rooting things in the Renaissance and what happened with the uh, the revolutions of the past, the English revolutions, the French revolutions, etc., what happened in Scandinavia and Germany, is that okay? I think the crucial thing is that the the great reform is not seen as left wing or right wing. Okay, we'll talk about this more later on in terms of reconciling the divisions of modern society. But the, the thing is, like, if you root root things in terms of um, the English Civil War, what happened in the 17th century, you make conservatives happy because basically no conservative actually, you know, wants to conserve or likes, is, is, they're not basically advocating feudal monarchy, are they? So when, when, when you have conservatives, what they want to conserve, what they like is what happened after the English Civil War, et cetera, all these reforms that happened after the Renaissance. So you kind of make conservatives happy because you're basically saying to conservatives, you're saying basically, look, these are the roots of what you hold dear about England, about America. This is what Amer made America great. This is what made England great. What made France, Germany great. This is what can make, you know, make America great again. <laughs> to to borrow that expression. I mean, so so okay, you kind of make the conservatives happy, but also because you're really talking about revolutionary movements and you're talking about what the the origins of the left wing. You're talking about this is what the left wing was originally about. Um, you know, some people uh, think I'm a left wing. 
you know, quite frankly, uh, I think the left wing today is is in a dismal state. I'm quite actually embarrassed to be associated with the left wing as it is today. No, really. <laughs> so people think I'm left wing because I talk about social reform and kind of like revolution, revolutions and stuff. But I think I think that the left wing is in a terrible state. And I think uh, by recapturing the actual essence of what the left wing was about by going back in time, you, you reconstruct the left wing for the 21st century, its values, what, what actually made it tick. So I, I think, I think the, the real revolution, that real movement that can actually succeed for the 21st century is that something that can actually incorporate left and right. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the thing I'll say about the, um, this little historical analysis. Okay, so we got we got uh, we got certain things in place. So now we're going to ask the analysis of the past. So um, a very good uh, quote is whoever whoever controls the past controls the future. Whoever controls the present controls the past. Now we don't control the present, but what you can do is you can change people's ideas about the past. So the past is really important. If you can do that, you can shape the future. Now, okay, now we're going to basically talk about the present and basically how do you now um, basically um, uh, turn these ideas into a, a, a social movement? Well, well, firstly, it involves communi communicating these ideas. So social movements happen on an individual level. So there's a process of communication going on. So in the same way, the Renaissance started from an epicenter. It was, it was basically a couple of people. It was one person, in fact. Okay, Marsilia Ficino translated all these works, um, including Corpus Semeticum and, and uh, Pica della Mirandola evangelized these works. And people like Giordano Bruno. You see, from an, a, an epicenter, these ideas spread and they literally changed Europe. They changed the world. But it took hundreds of years. You had the Gutenberg Press. You had basically people traveling all over Europe, especially uh, stonemasons who were like elite workers who, who spread these ideas around. But now we are in the 21st century. We have a lot more than the Gutenberg Press. We have, you know, like right like now I'm, I'm sitting in my, my front room. I'm talking to 10 people all around the world. Okay, so we, we actually do things on a far bigger and far, you know, you know in a far faster way, okay. So, so really, um, the, the, the social movement necessarily involves a kind of process of communicating these ideas. And then basically the idea is basically these ideas need to be implemented in social uh, policies and political, poli you know, political ideologies. And, and, and these ideas have to gain power. But essentially what, what's absolutely essential is that the, these ideas need to communicate to the, the minds of modern people. So what, what the what the worldview needs to do now, it needs to basically, it needs that the worldview needs to articulate the will of the age. So we talked about the past, the worldview now has to interpret the current, the current times, basically. So the problems of the world, the issues of the age, basically, you, you know what they are, because you you um you do a, in your head a kind of like summary or kind of like an analysis. What do you hear in the news? You hear conflict like uh, extremism, um, kind of wars and rumors of wars, impending war with China, Russia, Iran, kind of conflicts within a country, left wing versus right wing, football hooligans in Leicester Square, kind of, you know, uh, kind of, um, there's this, this kind of conflicts, divided world society. Obviously the ecological environmental catastrophe looms large and it's gonna get larger and larger. The, the heat waves in America, the kind of like uh, the ongoing destruction of the planet that's going to get you know it's going to loom larger and larger and all these issues basically uh to do with uh, kind of um identity to do with religion the god debate that's been you know raging it's still raging basically what the this, this social movement and what this worldview has to do it basically has to articulate the will of the age it has to frame the problems of the world the issues of the age all of them into this grand narrative which means basically the uh, planet in peril, the universal decline of religion, this one world order, the, the world becoming one place, this clash of civilizations, uh, and even uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the technological revolution, that's really important. Yuval, Yuval Noah Harare, um, he said in an interview, he said basically that what strikes him the most um, is that no one, as far as he can tell, not on the left wing or the right wing, can clearly articulate Okay, his exact words, a serious, meaningful vision of the 21st century and where humanity will be in 2050 that incorporates 
okay, he says specifically, uh, he lists three things, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, climate change, and all that. So lots of other things. Okay, so what this worldview needs to do, it needs to incorporate all these things, including the advent of this fourth industrial revolution, the advent of bi you know, biotechnology and artificial intelligence. That's gonna completely change the world, the technological singularity. It needs to incorporate all these issues within itself. But crucially, it needs to basically uh, be communicated out into the world, but also needs to provide the answer. So it needs to articulate the, the issues of this age. It needs to articulate the will of the age, but then it needs to articulate how to realize the will of the age. Now that's hugely ambitious, isn't it? But how do you do that? I mean, you do it by basically uh, you know, framing all these issues within this kind of like mythic prophetic framework. So the planet in peril. Okay, we are in Camelot in disarray. We're basically, this is uh, kind of like, uh, we're about to be overrun by the orcs. We're about to be, you know, Death Star is about to be built. You know, this is impending doom. You frame it in the mythic narrative, but crucially, you must uh, basically provide the means by which this kind of like tension you're building in people's heads to be realized. And you frame it in terms of basically the future. Okay, the best way to predict the future is to create it. But then how do we create it? We need to create a vision of what is we're trying to create. Okay, so what's absolutely essential, okay, is basically in our worldview for the future, you have to have a utopian vision. It has to be explicit. It has to be, you know, really clear. And uh, it also has to be rooted in history. So the Renaissance, which really created the modern world, <coughs> basically it was a recurring theme, this idea of utopia starting from Thomas More, uh, the book Utopia, um, famously um, Francis Bacon's uh, New Atlantis, um, Tommaso Campanella, The City in the Sun, we can go on and on. Um, we, we mentioned uh, Johann Valentin Andrea, his, 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 his um, Christian Napolis, guy who claimed to write the Rosicrucian Manifesto. Well, anyway, the vision of the, the future is utopia. You have to define it in terms of what the social movement needs to do is not just saving the planet. It's basically space exploration, kind of taking all the energy from the, you know, like a fusion power and then basically realizing explicitly and also in, in very graphic terms what the future is. So the Venus project was very good, even though it had loads of bad ideas, um, you know, like uh, the, the resource-based economy, I didn't think it would ever work. But I mean, what they did very well was they drew in very vivid terms, pictures of what the ideal world is gonna be. Okay, so you need to create this utopia and you basically need to create the vision of what the world you're trying to create, articulate it clearly, that you're working for something. It's not just we a movement that is basically against something or basically a movement that is kind of like a, one of the things which um, Extinction Rebellion do very well is this kind of like mourning the death of the planet and basically, you know, kind of like, the, you know, things going really badly wrong with the environment. But, um, you know, my discussions with m members of XR I've had in the past in when I went down for my, my interview with, with the team a couple of years ago, I told them what they're lacking is a utopian vision. Now many of the, the, many of the leadership agreed with me, but it has to be crystal clear and that has to be put to the forefront. It's not just about having the things you're against and the things you're trying to save and the things you're trying to rebel against. You must have a positive vision. But the, the, the critical thing, you must show the steps in which that vision is realized. Okay, so basically that is where you go back to history and you take the ideas or the organizing methods of history and transplant them into the 21st century. Now, look, what, what I'm not trying to uh, communicate is a specific manifesto or specific list of demands or kind of like, a, or even a kind of like, a, I'm not left wing or right wing. What it means is basically you have a goal, you have a worldview, and basically it is up for strategists and tacticians then to fill in the details to realize that future perfect state. But the most, the most important thing is you have to get people's kind of like, um, I guess, revolutionary consciousness activated in a way that's not kind of, you know, kind of Marxist class struggle or kind of like NSDAP, Mein Kampf, race struggle. It has to be a kind of shared identity. Now, a critical factor, if you really want to do this thing, okay, a critical factor, for this um, way of uh, activating and also communicating to as many people as possible is not to start an ecological movement or 
you have you have many kind of like uh, kind of technological like cults emerging or purely technological movements, singularity movements, etc. You have right wing insurrection movements. You have left wing kind of revolutionary movements, and they're all divided. They're all kind of like really uh, pursuing their own aims, and none of them ever get into power. Even the Green Party, even though I sympathise massively what the, what they're doing, they never get into power. Okay. Um, even in proportional representation countries, basically their influence is very limited. I propose basically the worldview, what's essential, what it has to do, okay, it has to somehow bridge all these separate divides. So I'm not talking about specific policies or specific strategies. I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna you know, uh, try and explain to people how to make a superior Molotov cocktail. You know, these, these are things might be important in certain contexts. Well, what's really important is basically you need to activate people and, and this idea needs to communicate to as many people as possible. So, so, okay, the idea, the next thing I'm going to communicate is basically the idea, okay, you see the diagram here, the crucial thing is that basically this, this in itself is an is a, is a essential aim that somehow you can reconcile division in, in society, within a society, America is so divided, so polarized, but so is the UK. And uh, it's divided uh, on so many dimensions. And the world is divided by religion and race and countries and trade and blocks and stuff. And uh, one critical thing for any kind of movement that supposes to save the environment or basically bring about some kind of transition, it can't be local, it can't be national. You know, uh, climate change isn't going to be solved on a national level. Somehow it must communicate to all religions, all races, and all different peoples in this world. So, so basically, okay, th there are five points here. And basically, um, these are really, I, th I think, the five essential points for really bringing the people together into a, a common cause, essentially. So the things we're aiming for really require a kind of unified humanity. So this is a huge aim in itself, um, together with the kind of like uh, specific mechanisms of revolution, revolution and ways that happened earlier on in history that we talked about earlier. Okay, we, we already have, okay, this universal cosmology and metaphysics, because it's not just about when I talked about the Renaissance, okay, the Prisca Theologia, the same ideas actually found in Hinduism, in mystical Islam, in mystical Judaism, mystical um, Hermetic Christianity, etc. Okay, so it's, it's actually quite universal, in Vajrayana Buddhism. It is also, uh, the, you know, the core idea in the kind of psychedelic religion, this kind of mystical core in, in the psychedelic world scene, the, I guess, the international trance scene, shares it's the same uh, essential beliefs which also includes indigenous shamanistic religion. So really, it's, it's a universal cosmology and a universal metaphysics. This perennial wisdom, this Prisca theologia, the esoteric religion, it communicates to all the esoteric traditions of the world. That's one unification we, we have already. Now, the universal uh, worldview, okay, is derived from that cosmology and metaphysics, but so, the, so is the universal narrative. So the universal narrative is universal. It's not just about Western culture, Star Wars, Dune, et cetera. The monomyth is the mythology, the myth mythic traditions from all over the world, including uh, stories of uh, people like Jesus, Buddha, and Muhammad. So, so really, the, the universal narrative, uh, basically, that is also um, kind of drives revolutionary movements. It's something that can communicate the world over. Okay, now, now point four is really important because the idea of accommodating the spectrum of belief the idea is this, okay, we believe that somehow you must have these, you can use these really quite difficult uh, mystical ideas, uh, the, the really extreme idea in talk two was somehow that we're all God, okay, that we're all one consciousness, okay, this is at the heart of religion, this is at the heart of the Prisca Theologia, the Corpus Medicum. Okay, if you're going to start a world social movement that can communicate all different social movements of the world, obviously you don't put that at the forefront, but it's part of a spectrum of belief, okay. Let me explain this idea, it's really important. There's a spectrum of belief, okay, when people discovered that the world was round, okay, that's the truth, isn't it? The world is round, but in a sense, the world is still flat. So an architect doesn't really have to take into account the curvature of the planet when he's designing his houses. Okay, so, so for all intents and purposes, on a kind of like a you know, mundane reality, kind of like normal life, for all intents and purposes, the world is flat. And the world is around at the same time is a spectrum of belief. And also, um, when we discovered that the Earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around, okay, it still makes sense to say that this, it's sunrise and sunset. Okay, so in a sense, the sun still rises and the sun still sets. Okay, 
So even though we've introduced all these ideas of a purposeful universe, of one consciousness, illusory universe, somehow reality being illusory and mathematical, and, and you know, at the same time, the, the life, the universe can seem purposeless. And we, we can't navigate life thinking we're all one consciousness. We have to think in terms of we're all different people and different multi, a multitude of consciousnesses. So that's that's one idea, basically, that we uh, we form a basically a worldview which has the, the the most difficult of ideas, the idea that we're all one consciousness, as one extreme. Okay, but we incorporate it in the worldview, and the people who might think, oh, those crazy mystics, that's that's fine. We just have to get those people to accept that that's one extreme view. But those crazy mystics are also the people who tend to instigate revolutions. They're the ones who tend to start, get the ball rolling. So that's essential that basically you have that as a part of your worldview, because really, you know, um, we talked about the Nazi party and the Tula society. It's a mystical society that for, uh, really founded on the ideas of Guido von Liszt, who taught that everyone is God, straight from the Corpus Meticum. And, and all the revolutions in, uh, in Islam essentially are, essentially often the case it was the Sufi mystics who totally believe in it. The recurring pattern history is basically these social movements get started, they get the, the, the ball gets rolling exactly by these people who totally believe in this extreme. So it's essential to incorporate it. Even Extinction Rebellion, I mean, Gail Bradbrook had her mystical experiences when I met the team two years ago, the team as it was XR, in their headquarters in, near Warren Street two years ago, uh, uh, talking to the team, many of them were totally at that, you know, extreme, uh, they've had their mystical experiences and have got heavily involved in these social movements. So I think, I think basically the worldview, yes, the, the, uh, the, the um, accommodating the spectrum of belief, basically, but you have to have that mystical core that really kind of like gets the ball rolling and drives these social movements in the first place. Okay. Now, point five, okay, point five is really important. We've got to reconcile the political and ideological polar opposites of the world. We, we discussed already reconciling the left wing and the right wing, okay, in terms of this worldview, which goes back to Renaissance, in, in particular with uh, the history of the United Kingdom. Okay, so, so what's really important is basically this idea that you have to reconcile polar opposites. So the, the, the social movement that can really uh, do things to do with uh, climate change and to do with reconciling, stopping war, you know, kind of really building this better world has to somehow heal divisions, particularly in America, between left wing, right wing, Democrat, Republican, etc. And the way to do this is, is this. This is really important. OK, this is, is this. In, in terms of the current political debates, OK, OK, um, you hear it on the news all the time. It's okay, the left wing, right wing thing. This is on the news all the time. And we hear it all the time, conservative, progressive, you know, you know fighting in the streets, kind of like uh, you hear it on the news. Okay, the, the issue of socialist, capitalist. Uh, in America, anyone who advocates any social program is called a socialist, even though you know, Bernie Sanders in Europe would be considered right wing, but he's considered socialist in America. Okay, so this idea of capitalism versus socialism is kind of like polar opposites. And, uh, you know, the, the, the internationalist versus nationalist debate, the whole Brexit thing is nationalists, you know, basically want to break away, want to do our own thing versus internationalists, we want to be more international. So, I mean, um, you know, and I, I know some Brexiteers say we are internationalists, but that, that's, a, that's a bit of a joke because basically you've broken away from, you know, kind of like 500 million people to kind of like uh, link up with, uh, you, you know, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, maybe kind of less than 100 million people. So I think it's a, a kind of raging debate now, basically nationalism versus internationalism. And, uh, okay, we, we, we won't um, pause the liberty. That, that's a bit of a thing we'll do for another talk. And the other kind of great divide is technology, industry versus eco and environmentalism. Now, now the simple uh, idea which kind of really um, reconciles and actually solves this problem is a very old idea, okay? It's the notion of basically that we are basically living in a world of polarities. And this is one of the problems of the world. This is why any kind of like mass social movement that can really get lots of people on board never happens because the, the world is so polarized between these two extremes uh, that we've kind of listed. Uh, okay, the, 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 the ancient idea and the very sensible idea 
is the notion, okay, it's called a golden mean, okay, it's a very old idea. Okay, in, in uh, ancient Greece, it was the idea that basically virtue is always a mean between two extremes. So basically too much, too much bravery is recklessness and, and not enough bravery is cowardice. So it's a simple idea. It's, it's basically, uh, it's not one or the other. You basically observe the mean, but sometimes you, you have to fluctuate one to the other, okay? So it's a, and also it's a very powerful idea that can be communicated because it's also in, um, in Chinese uh, kind of like philosophy and uh, kind of politics. Uh, Confucianism talks about the doctrine of the mean, exactly the same idea. Taoism talks about polar opposites, not just yin and yang, male and female, chaos and order. The man of the Tao respects both polarities. He balances both polarities, all polarities. That, that is virtue, basically. Buddhism is called the middle way. In the Quran, there's numerous references that, you know, we have made you a moderate middle nation, a kind of even, even balanced nation. And uh, prophecies for Imam Mahdi talk about the, the teachings of the virtue being always the mean between two extremes. We can go to the Bible, we can go to the Jewish scriptures and stuff. It's a recurring idea. It's simply that, uh, basically, these polar opposites in politics, it's not one or the other. It is basically, you need both. This is such a simple idea that the, the revolution I have in mind, it seeks to restore moderation to an extremist world. Now, we think, you know, extremism in terms of religious extremism, Muslim extremism, and, uh, you know, extreme fundamentalists, uh, Hindu fundamentalism, etc. that's extremism. But no, 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 extremism is also a part of Western culture now. You know, like a market fundamentalism, that is a form of extremism. The market knows best, the market, uh, you know, is always kind of right. We know the roots of this, okay, we know that, like, uh, we think of uh, Hitler, as being an extremist. This is to totalitarianism, that's one extreme. Stalin being a kind of extreme totalitarian, that's an unpleasant extreme we don't want, okay. But what's happened is basically the dominant uh, ideologies of today, Ayn Rand and von Hayek, neoliberalism, and absolute selfishness as a virtue, Ayn Rand. When you understand that basically Ayn Rand grew up in Leningrad, Stalinist Russia, you can understand that her philosophy is a direct opposite reaction to total, you know, kind of authoritarianism. You see, you go from one extreme and you bounce to the other extreme, to a total selfishness as a virtue. And also von Hayek grew up in Austria and he saw the excesses of Hitler. So basically he kind of bounced from one extreme, the kind of totalitarian of totalitarianism of Hitler to absolute free, free market fundamentalism. You know, absolute, uh, there's no society, uh, basically we're all kind of atomized units of basically economic freedom is political freedom basically so, so essentially what, what i'm saying is basically we are living in a world of extremists and it's such a simple idea to say basically we need to restore the golden mean and we do it through reference to you know religious scripture to greek philosophy etc and because it, it makes sense the idea that basically um america basically has gone from one extreme uh, during World War II, it went into a war economy because there was a terrific enemy to fight, you know, Nazi Germany and uh, Imperial Japan. But what happened was, was that America stuck to one extreme. It never left being in a war economy. So the idea of the golden mean is basically you stick to the mean, but sometimes you need to deviate from the mean, but you have to bounce back to the center again. So, so generally, I don't like violence. Okay, I don't like, I, I never got into fight. Well, actually, when I was five years old and six years old, I got to fights in the playground. But at some point I realized I, I didn't like this anymore. I really didn't like uh, kind of kicking people and biting people anymore. And, and, I, and after that, I, I stopped getting into fights in the playground, okay? But seriously, um, if, if uh, someone's gonna harm my kids and I had to do something and I basically, I had to hurt, you know, like get into some violence, I'd do it. Even though basically I observe the mean, sometimes you have to deviate from the mean. Do, do you see what I mean? So the golden mean idea really is a way of basically, uh, it, it's, it's moderation, but sometimes you do have to go bounce to the extremes. But it's also philosophy which allows us to reconcile all these divisions. So, so in, the, in the next diagram, it's basically um, everything we saw in this diagram. So it's not one or the other, one wing versus the other wing. The, the kind of real idea that have to get in people's heads that basically is of this idea of polar opposites that you can be left wing and right wing, 
progressive and conservative, socialist and capitalist. I mean, you know, China is basically a capitalist country, but it's obviously very socialist, very strong government, very strong uh, hyper-capitalism. Switzerland uh, is very strong government, very highly, regular, highly regulated, but is also one of the most capitalistic, most competitive economies in the world, okay? So to, to, to see, it's not one or the other. You, you can be internationalist and nationalist. Basically, you can respect, basically people have traditions, people, and you can, you can have borders, but you can have a very internationalist outlook. And also you can be completely technological and also respect the ecological. So, so essentially um, the, uh, the idea that basically um, you can use this idea to communicate to as many people as possible. And it's really a kind of, a kind of framework, but because we've been talking for a long time, can you still hear me? So Matt, can you still hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, I just had a yeah, we, we can hear you about your, saying, uh, We're loving questions. it. We're loving it. What have you changed? This is um, really um, powerful ideas, aren't they? They really are kind of like a really, uh, can, can you still see me? No, you can't, you can't see me. Okay. No, me turn your, yes, there we go. Okay, there it is. Oh, that's better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the, the, these are really uh, powerful ideas, aren't they? So it's essentially um, the social movement at the end of the day, yes, you, you can, you're going to need to spread the message around. You're going to need to form even political parties. You're going to have to form protest groups, even cells in, in different countries. So I'm saying the idea uh, to, in different contexts will manifest, manifest itself in different ways. I'm not saying there's a, a kind of uniform identikit approach uh, to uh, you know, implementing these ideas across the world. And different uh, people different organizations in different societies, in different situations will implement, implement it in different ways. I think what I propose is basically we resurrect and we basically replay, re recapitulate the process of the Renaissance. So we have to spread the ideas and ultimately the revolution happens on an individual basis. So there's a real process of communicating and canvassing. There's a real process of canvassing people. And to really uh, communicate, use uh, social uh, scientists talk about revolutionary movements, uh, really uh, uh, spreading through uh, kind of uh, networks of friends and also through family networks. But that's how it works. Of course, there'll be speeches. You need to give speeches. You need to print pamphlets. You need to print books. But the essential thing is you spread the ideas. You kind of, uh, I guess, kind of make a uh, kind of, I guess, a kind of blueprint. You kind of uh, list a kind of like a, 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 a kit of a kind of like a Lego kit of kind of ideas and strategies, and people will assemble the Lego kit in different ways in different places. So it's not about kind of like a, you know having having saying you know this is a uniform ideology, a uniform dogma. It's really a, a kind of overview of basically what's happened in the past and resurrecting it for the 21st century, and then basically having that template of the past to use as a guide for doing this thing in the 21st century. So we, we basically propose to, um, you know, cause everything that happened during the Renaissance, right to the uh, kind of romantic period when people realized that something was going wrong with the, the, the fall of spirituality. And we, we propose to really um, just, just resurrect the ideas which gave rise to all the kind of things which conservatives and, and kind of progressives like anyway. And basically, we propose to do this in the 21st century. So, it really, is a, a, for, for me, it's just basically uh, giving talks and making videos. But I mean, uh, for as time progresses, it will be people forming political parties and protest movements and uh, etc. I'll, I'll finish off this talk by us uh, connecting uh, everything I said with uh, the the other side of the message, if you like. So, so I made a decision uh, a couple of years ago, about two and a half years ago, I made a decision to have a sharp division between the political ideas and the fractal brain, fractal AI, fractal artificial intelligence ideas. There's, so basically everything I've said tonight and in the, the first talk and the second talk, there was absolutely no mention of the fractal brain theory or the, the AI work. So, so what, what, what I think my job is basically just to communicate this overall, overall blueprint. It's not for me to start specific social movements or start, you know, kind of like political parties or whatever. You're basically saying what's happened in the past. And I think people will take these ideas and they'll run with it. But my specific uh, kind of, what, I think my role is basically to um, communicate the ideas, but the fractal brain, the fractal genome work, Okay, there's a perfect dovetailing with the cosmology, 
and the, the metaphysical view with the uh, fractal brain, fractal genome stuff. It has to do with the idea of the, the universe being fractal, the universe being a giant organism, and the universe being a, a, a giant brain and a giant intelligence. So everything I've said in the first, second and third talks to do with politics and revolutionary movements has made no reference at all to the fractal brain, fractal genome stuff. But when, okay, it's my, my, my belief and it's my faith that if it's right, then in the future, the fractal brain, genome stuff and the creation of real true AI were essentially turbocharged to political message. So that's the that's that's what uh, that's what's going to happen. That's what I'm going to do. Because so th I guess that's it. Does that does that answer your question, Matt? I mean, that's basically I think the process that's going to happen. You you throw ideas out there, you communicate the history of what actually happened with these revolutionary movements, and people will use that history to form uh, revolutionary identities, but also form you know, formulate ideas and also use new ideas like ingenious ways of organizing using the internet and encrypted communications, all these kind of new things we can do for the 21st century. And then basically people will form their own synthesis. It's not really, I think my role is not really to kind of say specific things or specific strategies for any specific place. So, but I, that's what I think will happen. I think you basically start the kind of like, essentially, um, what you need to do is basically uh, in the first talk, I mean, Hegel's secret revolution, the secret revolution in the realm of ideas that he said was absolutely essential for the true revolution to happen in the spiritual revolution, the, the revolution in the zeitgeist. So what we talked about in, in our talks, the first, second and third talks is to instigate the revolution in the zeitgeist, the revolution in the realm of ideas, the revolution in worldview, which then is the necessary precursor for the actual revolution to occur. Okay, I'll finish it there. I'll stop, I'll stop it there. So basically, that is the, in a nutshell, the over, overall kind of like, I, I guess, you know, uh, I guess it's what um, all these political thinkers, these commentators, these kind of popularizers of revolution, um, you know, basically is what they are trying to articulate, but they can't articulate. They're all looking for this intellectual revolution, this new worldview, but they can't articulate it. They're looking for this new narrative, but they can't say what it is. So uh, we are trying to basically just fill in those details of the kind of revolution in the zeitgeist, the revolution in the realm of ideas. But once you have that revolution in place, then basically it gives the kind of foundation for all these kind of like, you know, these uh, social movements, which never succeed in changing the system or actually succeeding in changing anything much to actually then uh, have give them the kind of like tools and also the kind of like glue they need to actually scale up into something more effective. Okay, I'll, I'll take some questions. Okay, so that is, uh, that, that is it, essentially. Great. So uh, actually, I, I've, got about, I've got about five hours worth of material here, but I've just kind of like, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like two hours, for Christ's sake. It's like, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, guys, guys are, you guys are so incredibly patient. My God, I mean, amazing. I mean, it's like for me, I'm talking, and you know, I'm, I'm, uh, it feels like five minutes for me. You know, I can go, I can go for another few hours, but I mean, I, there's a certain attention span that people have. I know that basically, once you pass pass it, you basically have to stop. So, um, I, I guess I, I put this talk in three parts, but there's actually more material. What I'm going to do, guys, what I'm going to do, I'll, I'll be making a kind of a short format, ten minute segment videos from now on, basically. That's what I'll be doing. So basically the entire worldview is going to be rolled out in more kind of detail as the months and years go by. Okay. I guess that's it. Any questions? My God, it's been uh, almost two hours, but uh, any questions? Well, I have a, a comment and as usual, I adore your charisma. Thank you so much for everything you bring to the, the discussion. Oh, thanks, Nina. Um, I, I, I was going to say, it's very hard to get the energy up in my own flats, you know. No, you do. <laughs> you do. You are a maelstrom, a veritable maelstrom. Oh, thanks, thanks. You, you, if it's a public <laughs> venue, it's great because uh, you've got an audience. You're, you're rushing to the venue. you kind of all hyped up and adrenalized. Yeah. I find it very hard to actually generate the excitement, you know, generate an energy to actually get the words out, to tell you the truth. But thanks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's hard um, work. It's hard work giving a talk yeah. uh, just alone in my room here. I mean, it's easy. It's actually easy in a public venue because you've got you know, people. You just, uh, the adrenaline, you're standing in front of loads of people. You just, just do it. <laughs> I actually work really hard, you know, in front of my computer screen. Anyway, uh, so uh, what's your question, what, what, Nina? Well, it was just, it was a comment about, I so, um, I'd just like to validate your attempt to, to keep going meta 
and then meta again on finding the points of resolution and you know those golden mean touch points yeah i just yeah. I, I wanted to reflect to you that there there are a lot of people who themselves are they live they are a lived expression of crossover of these these polar opposites who right who come from a very sort of globalized international perspective and have lauded over and I'm, I'm thinking in particular, sorry, just to migrate while I'm talking. Um, there's a, a guy called Sam Petroda, for example, who was a telecoms minister and advisor to Rajiv Gandhi in the 80s. And he's made a lot of money making patents and landed up at the ITU and he himself is in exactly the same way you are trying to characterize the, the, the big touch points to, to find a way to move forward. Sam himself is characterizing similar ways of thinking in what he terms his latest book, Redesign the World. Now, having worked in the, 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 the belly of the International Telecommunications Union, um, he, he uh -huh. feels like the world is, he feels like the world is his home. So he's accustomed to internationalist um, ways of mobilizing movements and rollouts and infrastructure that, that culminates in a lived experience of, you know, um, using technology and, and living life. Yeah. I just think you putting your stake in, I, I personally am so excited by what you you bring to the discussion it's very important for us to actually aggregate your type of person to put you together with someone like sam petrodo who has the political cred who has financial backing that add all these exciting th you know um le levers to a discussion that would make it we, we need to just keep harvesting people who are trying to find the resolution points, the golden mean, as you say, and to make keep the global discussion moving and to widen the circle on those who are validating this very point. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. And, and to, to, keep, to keep amassing the group of communicators so that, so that we become, you know, it becomes a, a representative, it, it's a, like an alternative um, united, you know, the sort of UN con concept of the, those who are trying to step outside of the con a, a lot of the false binaries that are being lived out. Sorry, I've rambled a bit, but I, I just want to say that I, I like to take the, like theoretical discussions and, and to then locate it in the gathering of minds who are themselves thinking along these very lines, taking yeah, the yeah, big brush yeah. strokes, the big broad brush strokes, yeah. and wanting to communicate around ways out of the stasis, uh, yeah, because yeah. there is just so much potential. Um, but, but anyway, so that was my, my comment. Um, I, I want to see you talking to elders. You yeah, yeah, represent yeah, yeah. the youthful verve. Yeah. You, you are the future. But I would love to see you harn harnessing elders as well and, and, and starting to <clears throat> see how things land with them. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. thank you, Why? I, oh. I, I, re I remain a, a very <laughs> supporter. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for your, thanks for your, thanks for your very positive comments and support. Huh. Um, you know, seriously, um, I am still voice in the wilderness. I, I really am, but yes. my ideas are really developing. So, so really, uh, this this kind of thing has a longer gestation period. In fact, the only reason why you know me uh, is basically I, I give talks in southern England, okay. But the only reason why I have a kind of like people know me outside England is because I, I used to give talks in Bristol, okay, <laughs> Peter, Peter, uh, no. And uh, there happened to be um, a friend of mine, Dan Hughes, I met, he, there was a TV channel called PSTV and he basically filmed all my talks. It was like ah. a message in a bottle. So this is 10 years ago. So, so I'm an absolute voice in the wilderness. But even those uh, talks from 10 years ago, there's one called Revolutionary Movements and how to start one, okay? It was just a talk, okay, that was given in the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the Occupy movement back in 10 years ago. And, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, just that talk from 10 years ago really spread around. It's, it's got about 30, 40,000 views in Vimeo and YouTube. 
But through that, I met uh, people like, like Gail Bradbrook uh, years ago, and there's all these revolutionaries who have seen it already, and they, they write to me. So already, I, I'm kind of known to the kind of like um, a lot of people who are like Gail are either starting social movements or just looking for ideas. That's so even at this early stage, I'm still voice in the wilderness stage, even with my uh, kind of limited YouTube presence, it's getting out there. <laughs> But I think the next wave of ideas and more honed green screen videos, one of the reasons why I'm doing this Zoom talks is just to warm up the material and get my voice back in shape from two year, you know, year and a half of lockdown, mainly living on my own because my family's- That's it. Another part of my family's in Bishop Stortford. But anyway, um, so I think the next wave can really hit the kind of, you know what I'm saying, these kind of thinkers and this kind of jostling. It was always many people uh, with, uh, a lot of these elders have great big egos. You need to impress them. You need to basically, but also kind of get their support. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of political game just to kind of revolutionary people are very quite, often quite cantankerous, egotistical, snarly, gnarly people, I, I find. Okay, so, <laughs> so you have to negotiate this kind of really complex scene of uh, not kind of offending egos and kind of like getting your ideas and getting people to support you and work with you. And so it's a, it's a, it's a seriously um, hard game ahead of me just to get the ideas out there, but, but the allies will come. I think that, that that's naturally will happen. But I'm yes. really, uh, I, I see myself really as being in the voice in the wilderness phase. And, and but the uh, the lockdown, uh, the past year and a half, the message, the AI stuff, the brain theory has really advanced. I'm really excited to just package the new ideas in kind of uh, ten minute segments and just roll out the entire message. You know, I'm saying in front of my green screen, and I think that will really get the message <laughs> out there in a big way. Yes. So that's the next step. Anyway. Okay, any other questions or comments? Uh, I've kind of like a comment Peter. or a question. Peter. Sorry, you, you can let Peter go. So, okay, uh, thanks, uh, Why? I wouldn't say you're a voice in the wilderness. I think you're capturing a lot of what everybody else is feeling in many ways uh, across it. Uh, oh, but um, just uh, one as aspect which um, I think is a different angle to add in is one about the psychological state of how people are in populations around the world and the sort of nature of modern capitalism is very much driving its competitiveness rather than the collaboration angle that creates and adds to the fear to the insecurity and people just don't have the mind space in which to take on a lot of this stuff you could say as part of the sort of way in which it's uh, the polarities are sort of driving it, the, the press and the others who can make money out of this sort of um, creating the comp competition rather than the collaboration. And uh, so we have to sort of find something which can work at lots of levels, very simple at the level of people who are sort of go goes back to the Civil War, you know, the people who are sort of uh, struggling, they couldn't afford to live on the land yet, they couldn't sort of move, they couldn't do things. So how do you appeal to them? And you know things like take back control was an ideal uh, meme which caught the imagination of people who felt like that. Um, yeah, yeah. It doesn't give them back control at all. It actually gives. No, them no, no. <laughs> but there we go. Um, and then the more uh, sort of articulated sort of responses as you go up to the more sophisticated people and arguments and everything else to add in. So that psychological angle is is a very important one, I think, for modern world and the diversity of all the people you mentioned yeah 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 no peace totally i mean um the uh the the, the extra material I, I i didn't i didn't do was basically to do with the individual the existential dimension basically at, at the end of the day you've got this worldview this kind of grand metaphysical cosmological view at the end of the day it has to communicate to people and uh, basically, um, you know, a lot of the alienation in the world has to do with, okay, the, the modern industrial context, but also the philosophies, philosophies of Ayn Rand, you know, absolute selfishness as a virtue, and even the, the kind of capitalistic system, you know, kind of uh, like uh, it, it, what, what Margaret Thatcher instituted. I mean, I'm not saying she's all bad, but I mean, she kind of really kind of this emphasis on greed and capital accumulation, which really kind of broke a, bit, a lot of uh, what's good about UK society, I think. And um, so, so I think there is this kind of existential angle, which I think, but I think, I think there is a kind of angst and also there's a kind of like searching, there's a kind of longing. So I think um, on one level um, to basically to resurrect a kind of, uh, to re-excite people's imaginations for religion, to resurrect this Prisca theologia, you know what I'm saying, perennial wisdom, give people a sense that the universe is purposeful. That in itself is, is you're doing something, but if you can actually 
then turn that to political ends. That's even something else. You know, well, one of the things about worldview is that you have a worldview which is a grand construct. Okay, but one one of the things you need to do on an individual level, you need to distill certain points from that worldview that can captivate certain people, that then can get them to join this social movement, which is very broad. So obviously, the worldview you might distill aspects of ecology and environment to get people who might have joined the Green Party or Extinction Rebellion. But then you distill from this worldview the artificial intelligence and biotechnology aspects for those people who might join singularity movements or these modern kind of AI churches. So I think from a worldview, you distill certain things like social justice, like you know, combating racism, etc. So on an individual level, even though worldview is vast, basically the social movement is the worldview, but then you have to kind of angle it in a specific way to different people. But I think, especially young people, I think there is a sense of longing for a kind of communion, a kind of sense of, you know, a kind of like a, to, to a sense of belonging. I think this, there is a sense of alienation. At the same time, there is a kind of like a, a new a kind of opening for, for, especially amongst young people, they're kind of reacting against this kind of atomization of society. They are looking for something that is not street gangs, that's not, you know, that, that's not traditional political parties. That is something kind of like, that's not divided. I think there is a kind of a, like people are sick of, uh, you know, all these divisions and stuff. And I, I speak, uh, especially in London, you know, some message that shows that all these polarities, all these different religions, there's actually a common core. I think that will resonate with a lot of people. I think I mean, you're right. I, mean, I don't want to extend it too much, but um, I mean, the divide and rule is the simple way uh, it's done. But the religions had had the problem in, in the end of how to make it um, appropriate for each person. Uh, and so they just simplified it by saying, well, this is the dogma, you believe that. And because there's no other religions very much in each of those countries, and they could get away with it. But now we've got a much more libertarian and, and individualistic society. So everybody wants to believe different things in a sense. And so the whole dialogue has to include that ability for people to be diverse. But then you open yourself up to the divide and rule again. So it and the, the duality that comes out of that. So it's a tough, tough job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, I think I think it, I think it is that, that idea of like uh, you basically reconcile the duality. So it's not you know kind of like a total people want a communal experience, but also people want to be individual as well. It's kind of funny. I mean, uh, you know, I worked in a, in a church for ten years. You, you might you might know. I mean, uh, it was okay. It's the Church of England, but it really was pirate ship in, in the Church of England. It really was wild place. You know, New Age, pagan, mystery religion. It all went on there. Yeah. They let, they let me work there for Christ's sake, so it wasn't wasn't normal church. Okay, anyway, you, you you got this kind of like even in the Church of England. Okay, basically people got this sense of communion. You know, I remember like working on a Sunday and singing hymns. Okay, it's a church where William Blake was baptized. So in weddings and you know, I, I've sung the hymn Jerusalem probably thousands of times in my time working there. Just got selected for weddings and it's just sung constantly. Anyway. People had a sense of communion in that church. I realized it wasn't Bible basher. It was basically people just got together because they were, you know, and I think that's missing today because, you know, basically, but you don't want to start an organized religion. You want to start basically something, you want to create something that is communal, but not just going down the pub. But at the same time, you don't want, you know, basically you don't want to start a cult. You want separation and you want to create that kind of communal uh, sense as well. Switzerland, you know, Switzerland, I know quite a lot about Switzerland, basically, they embraced, they embraced a, a kind of like individualism. They basically, uh, after the revolution in the mid 19th century, they embraced a, a kind of um, individual responsibility. They embraced the kind of Adam Smith, they embraced John Locke. Okay, they, uh, they, they basically embraced this kind of capitalistic, individualistic creed. But at the same time, I, I see my, my partner's brothers, well, my, her, 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 her older or younger brothers, uh, do national service. Now, he, does, he's, he's, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't like, he's got a gun, but he doesn't like, uh, no, most, most people do have guns. They, they don't have uh, no gun violence, though. Um, he doesn't do uh, the Swiss army, but he um, goes to look after the bomb shelters. You know, Switzerland, Switzerland has enough nuclear bomb shelters for all the population, plus, plus number, no, another third for all the refugees that are going to flow from France, Germany, Switzerland. So he's one of the bomb shelter wardens. So Switzerland has this kind of like individualism. They're all kind of very independently minded, direct democracy, but they get, they get together and basically they, they get together as a country. And they, they, you know what I'm saying? There's a kind of sense of 
and, and uh, you know, they're, they're nationalistic, but not in a kind of, they're all proud of their country, but not in an obnoxious way, like some, you know, kind of <laughs> England fans are, you know, like, a, so, so, I mean, I think there is a way of actually having individualism. And uh, so, so I wouldn't say to Ayn, you know, I, I, I'm critical of Ayn Rand, but I don't say, I don't say, look, you gotta be totally selfless. There's a time for selfishness and there's a time for selflessness. I think it's reconciling the dualities again. So I think if you give, give people that, a kind of sense that, yes, we get together for, a demonstration or you know some political movement or some political party but then you're back you know as individuals as well i think that's the maybe that's the way of doing it yeah and your golden mean it's balancing freedom with responsibility whereas in the western culture mainly we just sell for freedom without responsibility exactly yes exactly and, and in china i'd say china might need a little more individuality and vice versa the west might need well particularly america might need a little more kind of you know, social cohesion kind of thing, you know, kind of like a, a kind of a communal aspect. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, that's, that's another kind of duality, Thanks. fundamental duality, isn't it? Actually, Adam that's Curtis talks about this a lot, that, you know, how to communicate a kind of like social left-wing social movement to an uh, atomized individualistic society. So that's one of his uh, recurring themes. And great, great guy. I mean, great. Uh, but he's, he's, he's one of the elders to get on board to this kind of thing. Because as he said, um, I, I was really uh, excited in March when I heard an old Russell Brand interview of Adam Curtis from two, three years back. And Adam Curtis said in the interview, he said, yeah, was, he said, what might happen is that there might be a synthesis of religion and science that might, you know, dream. He said, a, a paraphrase, he said, that's logically consistent, that can paint a picture of a better world that can inspire people. I'm paraphrasing. So even an atheist uh, left-wing propagandist, uh, documentary maker like Adam Curtis, can, can see or kind of like, you know what I'm saying, can actually be sympathetic to some kind of synthesis between religion and science. Yeah, any other That's questions? I'm working other... on, yep. I, I, I have a, a plan for that. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, Peter? I have a plan for that, yeah. That's what I've been working on. <laughs> uh, well, what's the plan? Oh, uh, just how to blend all of science and sort of um, spirituality and religion all into one uh, sort of cons... cons uh, working together sort of aspect which shows how it all is the same thing really yeah 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 yeah, yeah. That, that's the, that's the thing to communicate isn't it because because it really yeah. just enters the god debate which in itself is is interesting but then it expands into the, this whole political dimension isn't it really so so i think the, yeah. it, it is uh i think um i think the other thing adam curtis repeats again and again in his in his his recent documentaries about um um uh, hyper-normalization and the, the, other, the other one which was about uh, Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan he seems to imply that yes uh, the Soviet Union was destroyed in Afghanistan and that they kind of lost their kind of faith in communism but same thing's happening in the west now that you know it's, it's, it's a almost place of disenchant you know where you get broken and you come back disillusioned and he's also hints he was hints that basically yes there's something going on with uh, Afghanistan that they have something that we don't have or the West has doesn't have, and he's tends to think that basically they have this thing. They have a kind of like a because he constantly talks about that they have a sense of higher purpose. That um, you know neoliberalism has given us this kind of like you know negative freedom that we basically can consume. That we're free from coercion, but we don't have the freedom to do something positive. And he tends to say that basically yes, Islam. These people are fanatics and they're crazy and they do horrible things, but they have this kind of positive freedom. And he's saying that that's what, I, I, that's what I get from Adam Curtis's documentaries, that, that, that maybe this is what's missing in, in the West. But if you give people a kind of a coherent, logical, uh, you know, something that synthesizes religion and technology, a kind of a utopian vision that is kind of aligned and is framed in a mythic prophetic context, and you give that for something uh, for people to work towards, then I think that might be something interesting. And also, and also, um, I didn't, I, I had it in my notes, but I didn't say it in the talk, but a recurring theme with uh, people like Yuvo Noah Harare, even like people like Peter Thiel, and uh, it's recurring, Dan Brown, is that somehow they are talking about the idea of technology giving us godlike powers, and it's resonating with people. Okay, so we're like uh, demigods with godlike powers of life extension. If you're saying that we can live, you know, however long we want, billions of years, billions of years, we'll be a godlike. Now that's an interesting idea that appeals to people, but, but what, what, what if we married the idea with the idea of the corpus meticum, what the idea of the, what the Renaissance men believe, okay, they believe that they, yes, they were creating technology, that magic was the highest expression of natural philosophy, i.e. science. You know, uh, Francis Bacon saying, 
uh, in New Atlantis, science, the, the, the end of our foundation is the knowledge of causes and secret motions of things and the enlarging of the bounds of human empire to the affecting of all things possible, i.e. technology. Okay. But, but the Renaissance men believe, yes, like, like all these uh, modern thinkers, that uh, we become godlike. We enter into the powers, become one with God. So in the Corpus Medicum, it's actually saying that uh, you enter into the powers, to enter into God. So they believe not just in creating technology to be like little demigods. They believe in the path of technology and gaining power as a means of spiritual transcendence. Did, did, did you get it? So basically, we're taking the ideas of these atheist um, uh, kind of thinkers and philosophers, and just we're just adding that that transcendent dimension and rooting it in the ideas of the Renaissance and the Corpus Medicum. And I think that's a maybe another another angle, a killer angle to. You know what I'm saying? It's like, almost like Yuval Noah Harari plus plus. <laughs> so, so you're taking existing ideas, you can't just basically take them to another level, which is important if you want to start, you know, a kind of like social movement that's going to excite people because you're basically taking existing ideas and you're basically extending them to, to a higher level, really, I think. That's another angle, maybe. Yeah. Anyway, any other questions? Any other? Well, I've got one. Matt. Uh, let's Matt. see. So, uh... You were talking about uh, need for a clear utopian uh, vision of the future, and uh, I believe that, uh, like technologically speaking, if uh, someone like an Elon Musk could communicate like a good uh, technological vision of the future, like here's these technologies that are possible, go out and invent them, that could be like that mystical call to adventure for the 21st century. And so my question is, uh, do you have any, uh, can you articulate any vision of the future, technologically speaking, like involving AI or technology? Oh, oh yeah, I, I think, I think, uh, I think this, this kind of social movement, I, I think, okay. okay, firstly, I'd say, I'd say it's really important to get these uh, kind of uh, Iron Rand worshipping uh, tech billionaires on board. Okay, and I think I think one of the ways to do it, if you can give them really exciting ideas about artificial intelligence, what's you, you know the whole uh, tech scene, Silicon Valley, Silicon Shenzhen, you know China, all over the world, Israel, the, the whole the whole artificial intelligence scene is actually there's something missing, and that, that thing is artificial intelligence. There's no artificial intelligence. Okay, you know like the part. So, so basically, it's this old technology, the machine learning technologies from 50 years ago, which didn't actually quite work. Even Elon Musk is realizing that you know self-driving cars, level five self-driving cars, is really hard. Even he said it in a recent interview. So, so, okay, so they are really into Iron Rand, Silicon Valley. They're really into Yu Yuval Noah Harari. Uh, he's he's really uh, kind of like celebrated academic there now. So, so I think I think you can, you can get these people on board by by saying yeah, yeah, mellow out the Iron Rand with a little bit of altruism. And you know, give them this kind of like because they go to Burning Man anyway. So you know, it's just a matter of time. Someone slips LSD into their drink or whatever. They're going to get the transcendent thing, aren't they? I mean, it's just a matter of time. Uh, they might know already. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, but they're into Burning Man, and so there is this kind of like uh, kind of openness to ideas in Silicon Valley. And I think there, that's one kind of a uh, kind of segment of uh, you know modern society. You really need on board because they okay. And one of the ways to do that, if you can communicate interesting um, kind of uh, artificial intelligence ideas to these people, um, and also uh, married with a kind of like a broader uh, political religious ideas, because I think they'll be very open to it. It's almost as if Karl Marx said new uh, commercial classes, uh, that political power emerges from new, uh, you know, it's all structural, you know, new uh, capitalists emerge and that leads to kind of political power. Well, it's also the new uh, kind of capitalist classes emerge in the past few decades. And it's, it's not just Silicon Valley, it's biotech, it's basically high tech. And these, these are multi-billionaires and it's worth billions and billions. Apple sits on trillions of, not capital, it sits on a, a mountain of uh, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of billions of cash. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and basically this power, this structural power that exists in modern Western and also in all industrialized economies, it's, it's, it's also looking for a political outlet it doesn't know whether it's Republican, doesn't know whether it's Democrat. It, it, you know what I'm saying? It's looking for almost like a, 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 an expression of what it is politically. And if you can actually tap into their kind of obviously love of technology and the love of certain principles, Libertine and also even Ayn Rand, but also mellow it out with these, uh, these other kind of like opposites of the polar, polar opposites, they can mellow them out. Then I think, and I think that's a very powerful uh, kind of base you can use to uh, help propel these ideas, you know, really. So that's one 
aim, well, look, one of the aims I have in, in the, one of the plans long term is I think, look, it's a matter of faith, but I, I think the fractal brain theory, the fractal brain stuff, the big idea, you know, the symmetry between genome, neuron, you know, brain, genome, and uh, you know what I'm saying, uh, evolution, the, the symmetry between life and intelligence. That, and then the idea that that big idea, the, the symmetry between life and intelligence gives rise to true artificial intelligence. Okay, so essentially, I, I think it, it's not just clever, I think it's right. Okay, so that's, that's okay, I, I don't, I'm not asking people to believe that, but I believe it. I try to, I do talks to try and convince other people to believe it. Okay, but this is what I believe. So, so this is my faith that, that if I am right, and basically that I can use that as a stepping stone to communicate to all these industrialists, Elon Musk. So let's look, I'll let you into my, 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 my fantasies. These, these are my daydreams. Okay? I'll let you into my daydreams. So I visualize things and they happen. So I visualize things. So I basically visualize and I think it's going to happen next year, two years' time, three years' time, whatever. I'll be giving a lecture. I'll be talking to Elon Musk. So I'm visualizing. It's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. I'll be telling you know, Elon Musk and his engineers, this is how you do it. I'll be, I'll be going to Google. I'll be giving lectures. And I'll be giving lectures Mark Zuckerberg. That's what I think. Okay, That's what I believe. That's what I'm saying. Uh, the voice in the wilderness one day will you know, basically come out of the wilderness and be giving lectures in these different corporations. And I think, I think you give them the, the artificial intelligence, you give them the ideas about the brain, but then I think you can really, they'll, I think they'll be really responsive to the wider message. And I think these are kind of people you get on board along with environmentalists, along with all these other people, along with politicos, along with anarchists, you know, all these other kind of political groupings. But I think the, your question, sorry, I've really diverged. Um, your question, what is the vision for the, uh, basically it is to create artificial intelligence it is to put the fourth industrial revolution on steroids. And I believe basically, yes, uh, the, eco, e, the eco environmental catastrophe, we can basically the, 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 use this technology to harness the energy of the planet that is latent, that needs to be harnessed to really not just save the planet, but to, the people talk about terraforming Mars, don't they? Well, if you, if, you, you can, if you can terraform Mars, surely you can terraform Earth. You can turn the Sahara Desert into lush pasture and forest. You can basically reforest. You know, Australia used to be forested, apparently. The ancestors of Aborigines slashed and burned all Australia. You can basically reforest Australia. The mountains of Hawaii used to have plantation on top of them. They're all bare now. You can reforest the mountains of Hawaii. I'm saying that is an ecological dream that can be realized through technology. You know, 1.3 trillion, um, 1.3 trillion cubic kilometers of seawater and just a few kilometers of seawater contain the energy of all the oil, gas and coal that's ever existed in a, on this planet in the form of deuterium, the, 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 the raw material for fusion power. If you can tap that energy, okay, for space travel, but also for uh, the kind of re-greening of the planet. And also in terms of technological vision, once you have AI, basically, not, it's not just life extension, it's basically, um, you know, what these people, it's a waste of money, Jeff Bezos and uh, Richard Branson and Elon Musk, you know, kind of like uh, their vanity projects. Now, Elon Musk is actually better because he's actually, he's actually aiming for industry and actually making, you know, serving humanity. But the, the fact of the matter is that there is this kind of push into space. And I think, the, I think in terms of the global picture of what we're trying to communicate, if the universe is eventually going to become the cosmic Christ and the universal Vishnu, the celestial Buddha, it comes about because the people on the planets explore space. So space exploration becomes part of a cosmic spiritual mission, along with mining asteroids and, you know, kind of like uh, accessing. So it's a worldview, but it's also a cosmic view that can really inspire this kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of industrial um, kind of technological class, but if you can actually deliver artificial intelligence, okay, uh, to uh, this uh, kind of like industrial te uh, technological class, then I, I think that gives, okay, I, 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 I'll lay more into my kind of like wet dreams, okay, basically what, what I think is that in my, in my passions, in my dreams, in my, when, when I'm daydreaming, okay, what, what, this is what I, I, I dream, basically that uh, someone who creates true artificial intelligence can use that as a platform to get his ideas on the brain accepted and the fractal genome. Okay, so, so like, it's really hard to get scientific ideas accepted. So I, so I don't try, I don't go to scientific, scientific conferences to you know, present papers on genomes and brains because it's futile, it's a waste of time. Okay, so I think the shortcut to get the scientific ideas accepted is the creation of true AI. Okay, so, so in my dreams, okay, the person who creates true AI 
and then gets this theory about you know the the, the universe uh, uh sorry the, the theory about the, the the fractal genome fractal brain that extrapolates to the universe accepted okay as a scientific theory okay okay because it's, it's actually i can communicate it not just the scientists gene uh, you know uh, geno genomic uh kind of uh, functional genomics people and also brain scientists and neuroscientists i can communicate it to them but i can also communicate it to lay people so once i have the platform through creation of artificial intelligence to communicate those scientific ideas and then it's accepted that gives me a platform to talk about religion and politics that no one has ever had in the history of this planet so, so that's, that's my that's my fantasy okay that's my that's my, uh, you know, when I'm really kind of like um, high and on stuff, that's what I dream about, okay. So, so I, kind of, I kind of exposed myself to you. I kind of like revealed my inner kind of little dark secrets, okay. So that's what, that's what I, but look, look, look so, so that, that I have faith that that's gonna happen. But in the meantime, these, these, I think these ideas can really uh, be seeded out in there and people will use these ideas. But in the long run, if I can, you know, then, then hit that, the ultimate goal, then these ideas are really turbocharged, and it just happens much, much faster. So that's the that's the overall that's the overall aim. Yeah. So it is a it is a it is a kind of a revolution in ideas about religion, a revolution about ideas in politics and society and economics and stuff. But also, ultimately, what's really going to push it is this technological kind of vision, I guess. Technological. Uh, it is a technological utopia. I, I, I think that's that's really important. That is also you know goes hand in hand with this eco environmental. Utopia. Okay, so I'll say, uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Well, that's two, two hours, 20 minutes. Any other questions? Well, that's, that is a marathon session. That's really, uh, that's, that's really, really fun. That's really enjoyable. Wait, what's your yeah. next one? What's your next one now? What's did, your, did, did what's you know, your um, peer? Sorry, next 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 talk. Yeah, where where are you going from here? Oh, did you know? I was I was a bit disillusioned that Facebook only let me put out fifty invites because it's so easy to do these Zoom talks just because it was easy to promote on Facebook. So so what I was thinking of doing, I mean, I, it, it is it is July and this is a kind of dead time for talks and uh, basically, I mean, uh, I, th I think because it, 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 the uh, normally on Facebook you, you promote to 50, 50 people and there's only about 20, 30 people come to the talks. So I was, I was thinking um, th this might be the the uh, the last Zoom talk for a little bit just because because I don't want to pay Facebook to you know kind of get no. the uh, get, get get the numbers up. Uh, so what, what I'm going to do, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, basically, um, but I might, have, I have, might have Zoom meetings, I might have Zoom meetings just to talk about things, just to have like, mm. like a, like I might do it regularly, so I don't have to promote it, so people know that there's going to be these kind of like talks where I just basically like jam new ideas and then extended questions and answers sessions. Beautiful. That's, that's, that's what I might do. So it won't be kind of epic two-hour talks, it might be a kind of regular weekly thing where, where it's going to be uh, 90 minutes maximum, there'll be a time limit. Now, basically, you know, kind of like present ideas, but be, a lot of it will be questions and answers. I might, I might do that. But uh -huh. the, what, I, what I plan is that I, I just basically moved into this new flat. This, this living room is really big and there's lights. I've got lights, basically. So basically, the, the, the camera I'm using is actually a very good camera you're looking at me now. So basically, I've got a green screen. I've got stuff. What, what's going to happen um, in, in, in the months to come and in the years to come is I'm going to make loads of uh, short segmented green screen videos nice. so, so what, what i used to do in hour and a half two hour talks i'm basically going to segment so it'll be, be part x of 14 talks or whatever but each one will be five ten minutes long and i'll basically segment the entire message because i think it'll really get the message out there each segment will have some kind of punchline some kind of something that can really grab attention some kind of nice. killer idea kind of thing and uh, I'm basically gonna really um, start like a production line in, in, in this in this place now, and just sell up my lights and make maybe make a video at least once a week, and just keep making videos. Nice. And, and that's Great. what I'll do. But I think I think meetings are really important. But I also because I'm sent, I'm in central London. One reason why I got this flat because it's really central. I will hold meetings in London. But I think it'd be a good idea to hold regular international meetings on Zoom to do these yeah. kind of like idea jams and just get, you know, just, just have a discussion to, you know, try out ideas, get feedback basically. Mm. So, so I'll do that as well. 
Can we leave our email addresses so that you have a list of, well, all of us who would like to attend Q&A sessions or discussions? Do you yeah, mind I, I, should we... do, I should do that. No, I, I really need to get my act together. So I need to basically, uh, is, is, I'm just plain lazy. You, you, you do something on Facebook, just click, click, click. You've got 500 people and, and you usually get exactly. like a, you know, a, a crowd. No, this is a crowd. It's, it's, always, it's always quality rather than quantity. You know, basically it's a quality crowd. That's the main thing. And what, what I need to do is basically, yes, uh, be more systematic. And maybe if I do it regularly, so people know every week or every two weeks there's going to be some meeting. And there might be some, uh, you know, it might be a combination of different uh, talks on fractal brains or political stuff mixed together. But the main thing is to get feedback on the, on the ideas and be like a more kind of discussionary format kind of thing. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, by all means, I mean, connect with me. Um, give me an email. It'd be, it's much easier just to, uh, but I need to get my act together. So basically, I just need to basically <laughs> systematically get this thing, get this thing going. I mean, I pick up loads of emails. People write to me. Uh, off on a website, put me on your mailing list. But I haven't even, you know, put their names on the database yet. So I, I, it's basically, uh, it's the voice in the wilderness morphing into a kind of a more kind of multimedia entity. Do you know what I'm saying? That's so it's a kind of slow process. So yeah, so that's what's going to happen. So yeah. Nice. Thank okay. you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank, thank, you. thank you for my such. My God, you you, you have amazing concentration concentration span. <laughs> Because in my in my head, I think ninety minutes, and they're going to be frazzled. So basically, but amazing. I mean, it's easy for me because I'm all you know, adrenalized up. I know it's it's much more effort to hold attention than being the speaker. So fantastic. I mean, thanks for your patience and thanks for your concentration. Absolutely amazing. Thank okay, you. so thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And uh, keep in touch. Yeah, you give me emails and keep in touch. Connect with me on social media. If you like, if you'd like to donate and donate to me on PayPal or um, support me on Patreon, but I, I need to make things free. So, if, you know, basically that, that's optional. So basically in the, uh, in the, in the long run, basically uh, what I want to do is basically just to um, really use future resources, just to, you know, set up stuff and just give out stuff for free, basically even books in the future. Anyway, thanks for your thanks for your time. F fantastic, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Okay. Thanks, why? Thank you. I, I shall get something to eat. Have a cup of tea. Fantastic. F thanks for joining. Thanks for thanks a lot. Let's take a screenshot of the names. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so stop the screen share. Yeah, great. That was good. Great. Great. Oh, there's messages as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Great. Hey, hey, Matt. Thanks. Thanks again. You're welcome. <laughs> hey, nice one. Okay. Okay. So I guess I. Oh, did I record? Well, well Matt, hopefully see you next time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, yeah. Just okay. let us know when when you're having the next talk. Uh, you know, oh, my, my, wait, wait, wait. Are you on my Facebook? How do you know about these talks? Uh, let's say just on Facebook, you you post there, or you like give an announcement. Uh, let's see. Uh, maybe you could uh, link your Facebook uh, to like the YouTube video, like in the description of the YouTube video uh, when, when you post this on YouTube. So other people know where to go to look for the next announcement. You can okay, like okay. That that's, 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 I, I was going to make a YouTube video uh, just to say I'm going to make loads of YouTube videos, but I didn't get around to it. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. And, and, you know, you can always, like, put links to, like, your Patreon or PayPal, like, in the description, you, you, you know, for whoever wants to support you and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, so but, but just, I, 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 I so got to get my act together. I mean, my, my, my <laughs> website, I, I, I see what, you know, I, I, haven't worked, I haven't done anything on my website for years, you know, and, <laughs> I, so basically there's all these resources which I don't basically use. Yeah, and on top of that, you have to invent real AI, so to, you know, use that, use that platform to get your message out. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, no that's really <laughs> exciting, isn't it? I mean, really, the, uh, the political stuff is really um, interesting and uh, it goes on a lot of my brain. But the AI stuff, I mean, I, I can, I can really, uh, that, that's really exciting. You know, I think that in terms of generating revolutionary excitement, I think it's really the AI stuff that's really going to mm -hmm. say put this whole political message on steroids, really, on, on a whole other level. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Because uh, there's a like a YouTube, there's a YouTuber uh, who got like a lot of who's got a lot of uh, publicity. Like the yeah, what's his name? I think is uh, what is it? Lex Friedman. He like he's like an AI MIT AI guy, and he like does interviews with other like technology people, and that's got a lot of traction lately. And so you're like you're like exactly you'd be like a perfect guest for its podcast or something but i mean oh. that people are really interested in this type of stuff uh, oh yeah I, i'm just no, 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 that. matt i totally agree i totally agree that there's another one called uh, machine learning street talk which is very good and i, I, I sorry I, I don't i don't even blow my own trumpet i watch i watch i watch these uh, I, I see his channel I, I do watch his channel lex friedman well, well some of the talks then i realized i, I thought to myself um at some point i realized look lex your channel, there's no AI there. <laughs> there's no real oh, AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's part you know, of you got these attempts like, you know, a AI XI and stuff, all these kind of like, uh, you know, kind of oblique kind of th theories on, you know, true artificial intelligence. But no one's actually doing uh, kind of true artificial intelligence. You know, no one's really doing. Uh, there's all these questions, you know, all these issues. You know, symbolic versus sub-symbolic, all these issues of, you know, e even the idea of using symmetry in artificial intelligence, machine learning, but no one has any kind of true kind of synthesis, you know what I'm saying? And I yeah. think to myself, seeing these channels, I'm thinking, I mean, guys, I'm exactly the person you need on your show. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, you know, that, that's what I'm thinking. So, yeah, you know, it's just like getting into a position to get that message out there and stuff like that, so... Yeah, man, that, that yeah, will come. That will come. In yeah. the meantime, you know, the, the voice in the wilderness will finish his software, perfect his public speaking act, and, and make loads of videos. That will come. I think. I think it's a. Uh, the, the funny thing is, I mean, Lex Friedman plays a bit, a bit of guitar, doesn't he? I notice. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Maybe, maybe he does. Maybe. Maybe. I, I think that might be like in a description somewhere that I saw that, that he plays music. Yeah, he stuck a video once of him just him playing guitar, and I was thinking, I was thinking, you know, we 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 we'll have a we we'll have so much to talk about. But I think, yeah, I, I think it's it is a game. It is like a like like uh, you know what Nina was saying earlier about you have to just basically hit these people and social networks, and then basically get get involved. Well, obviously, um, in in the future, I, I, you know, I, I, this is quite a bold assertion. I think it's inevitable. It's inevitable that I'll, I'll be talking to Lex Friedman at some point. It's like what I was saying earlier, it's, 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 I don't, I don't, you know, to me, it's inevitable that I'll be talking to Elon Musk. It's inevitable. I'll be, I'll be basically, you know, having one on one conversation with yeah. him, g giving a lecture, he'll be in the audience, giving a lecture, you know, the, the Sergey Brin, all those Google people, Mark Zuckerberg, they'll be in the audience. So that's inevitable. So I think, I think Lex Friedman is someone I, I, I will basically be interviewed at some point and maybe sooner rather than later, hopefully. No, oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, I've seen like ideas like this. Oh, oh, oh what's his name? Oh, there's a psychologist named uh, Ian McGilchrist. I think uh, Jordan Peterson interviewed him. Uh, he, he's, I, th I think he's a, he's a psychiatrist or psychologist from, I think uh, maybe, it, maybe it's Oxford, but he says oh, yeah. he believes, yeah. he believes like everything is a process and stuff. And so here you're talking about like fractals and processes and it's like all these ideas are kind of like coming to the forefront. So it's like, there's this feeling of inevitability for all these ideas anyway but like yeah yeah for fun we talked we talked on and off about um gail bradbrook of uh founder of extinction rebellion he's really into G ian gilchrist so so yeah yeah that, that's that's interesting yep so yeah uh, so you know thanks for the talk and you know thanks for even though there's only like probably like 10 people or something you know you know thanks for putting it out there and oh man it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's all the effort it's, it's, it's always quality rather than quantity. No, no, 10 is amazing. Uh, July really is a dead time for talks. I mean, so it's amazing that people, I mean, 10 is a really good number for, you know, for, for political talk, J just on a, on 50, 50 invites on Facebook and a couple of reshares. That's, that's a quite mm -hmm. good audience. <laughs> All right, well, uh, th thanks a lot and look forward to your future content. Fantastic, man, have, have a good evening. Okay. Yeah, you too, you too. Okay, I get some food now. Okay, cheers, right. Matt. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. So I, Closed out. Okay, stop recording now. Stop recording and.